session two with a carpal instability and hopefully come back to cadavers a little bit. And I'm sorry. So our next session is going to be on carpal instability. And uh, Carol and I were actually talking about having Dr. Berger and Dr. Michael Vitz as our guest speakers and kind of just sitting back and relaxing and let the, the true experts do the talk and uh, teach the entire course. But uh, I'm going to actually have Dr. Friedrich introduce Dr. Berger next. Okay, good morning. Thanks, Jerry. Um, when we were deciding who to invite this year, I, uh, I pretty reflexively, and we were talking about instability, not that he's an unstable guy, but uh, <laughs> in talking about in various hand-related instabilities, I very quickly uh, lobbied for uh, uh, Dr. Berger as he was my training mentor in uh, fellowship, and I won't uh, reiterate all of his uh, innumerable accomplishments. Uh, I will just tell you that um, the year that I spent with him as my fellowship director was one of the best years of uh, one of the best years of my life. Uh, it was a supreme honor to to train with him, and it was actually a lot of fun. I found that we mostly communicated in the operating room mainly through movie quotes, um, and so that was uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. So the only thing that I'm actually upset about is that I have to follow him after his talk. So that's uh, that's going to be like taking Coles to Newcastle. So uh, to quote the Big Lebowski, the dude abides. So. Come on up, dear. <laughs> oh, that's great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And, and what a pleasure and honor it is. Good morning, everybody, uh, to, uh, uh, to be here. Um, I've been to uh, uh, Seattle twice before and uh, have enjoyed it each time. Couldn't wait to get back this time. So to all of my friends and colleagues uh, uh, here as well, thank you. Thank you so much. The picture on the left is uh, typical for uh, Rochester, Minnesota during the, during the winter. And you get to the point where you, you start to realize that nothing is really going to surprise you uh, about, about winter. I've seen uh, uh, people ride snowmobiles and cross-country skis to work. Uh, on the advice of uh, a number of uh, radio and television stations advising people to take the snow off of the eaves of their houses because they're going to develop ice dams. I've seen somebody hoist a snowblower onto their roof trying to at a, at a 30 degree angle and I was just sitting there thinking well thank goodness I'm not on call today because that person's going to be uh, coming into the operating room. But there was one episode that really did surprise me. We were in the midst of a substantial blizzard in Rochester, and uh, uh, Jeff and I lived in the same uh, uh, area of town, and we'd take the same, uh, same uh, road uh, into, uh, into work. And uh, it, was, it was really early in the morning. It was cold. It was literally a blizzard where there's horizontal snow and uh, poor visibility. And I remember seeing a snow plow uh, in front of me. Uh, that the snow plow is in front, and in the back they're spitting out a combination of sand and salt to uh, to keep the roadway from uh, being too slick. And all of a sudden, I noticed there's a sort of shadow behind the snow plow. And as I got closer, I realized it had a silver backpack on it with some blinking lights on it, and a, and a Nike low drag type of a bike uh, uh, a bike suit on. And it was a road, I think it was a road bike, actually. And I went around him, I said, you know, that's Dr. Friedrich. You know, I, I couldn't, I'd never seen a bicycle in, uh, in that kind of weather. You remember that day, too, don't you? I don't think there was a day you didn't ride your bike into, uh, into work. It was absolutely amazing. Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, but it, it inspired me, you know. I, I, I thought, uh, so on my second donut, I thought, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> so, some, someday maybe I'll, uh, I'll get to that point. <laughs> yeah. I forgot to ask, how do we actually advance this here? Is this uh, uh, this guy or? Oh, we just hit that. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, um, uh, again, it's a real pleasure to be here, and, and uh, this is one of my favorite topics uh, in terms of the carpal anatomy mechanics. It's what I uh, worked on my uh, doctoral thesis on. I was uh, fortunate enough to uh, uh, spend a year and a half working with one of the grandmasters of uh, hand anatomy, uh, uh, Johann, or as, as we all know him, Hans Lanzmier who uh, uh, discovered, among a number of things, uh, Lanzmier's ligament in the, in the finger, the oblique retinacular ligament. And I was able to uh, be with him for a year and a half as a Fulbright Scholar in Holland. And one of the things that, that I learned in, uh, in working with him, but also just being in Holland, 
uh, was the concept of, of, of looking at something in an altered state. You know, for example, if you look at, at some structure, when you, when you remove all the structures that normally surround it, you see it in a different light. Uh, Rembrandt uh, did this actually with his paintings. Um, he, he focused on the shadows. This is really where he made his name, was definition of, of objects in the shadows. He did a beautiful job, of course, with things that were illuminated, but if you look at his paintings in the original form, you'll see all sorts of subtle detail in the shadows. And I learned this with the, uh, the carpal anatomy. By taking the bones out, you can see where the, uh, the ligaments truly go. Uh, but it, 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 takes, it takes a certain amount of mental engagement in order to be able to do that. Well, what we're going to do with this uh, uh, presentation this morning, and I apologize if there's any redundancy and overlap with the, uh, uh, with the other faculty here. It, uh, one of my hats that I wear at Mayo is I'm a dean of the uh, Mayo School of Continuous Professional Development, so we're always engaged in adult learning theory. And, it, and uh, this is something that's been shown time and time again, is it takes 13 exposures to something as a new concept before it actually sticks. So uh, that should give you great relief. You know, when you walk out of a lecture and you say, God, I just can't remember this stuff. Well, it takes 13 times to get there. So we're going to probably be doing some of that today. And uh, I will uh, sort of apologize in advance. But on the other hand, we're contributing to that bank of 13 exposures here with this. Um, I do not have any uh, relevant financial uh, relationships of any kind to declare uh, for any material being pre uh, presented. Just a brief history, 52-year-old carpenter falls from a ladder. He's not the one with the snowblower on his roof. Uh, uh, onto his extended wrist, he got up. He thought it was just a sprain, but unfortunately, four months later, he comes in. He's got tenderness over the dorsal aspect of the scaphalunate joint. Uh, he's got a positive scaphoid shift sign with both a clunk and pain, and these are his uh, x-rays showing a diastasis. I was giving a lecture once at the uh, Cleveland Clinic, and uh, somebody uh, uh, pointed out that it was diastasis, and, or it was diastasis and not diastasis. And so I, I, I apologize for putting the emphasis on the wrong syllable. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so the, and there's an increased radial lunate angle, and the scaphalunate angle was also uh, uh, increased in this patient. And so uh, the diagnosis of scaphalunate dissociation was, uh, uh, was made. Now, I'm, I'm presenting this not as an overview of scaphalunate dissociation, but what we're going to do is we're going to study the anatomy of the carpus by decomposing what happens in scaphalunate uh, uh, dissociation. The same can be true with lunotriquetral, midcarpal, uh, uh, any of the carpal uh, uh, dissociations. If we, if we learn by taking them apart, and starting with the condition and working our way back, what has to happen in order for scaphalonate dissociation to occur, we're going to understand the normal anatomy and normal mechanics uh, more. So we're going to be looking at sort of an exploded view of, uh, of this as a model. And it is a model of predisposition. I'm surprised that all of us in this room don't have scaphalonate dissociation after putting this sequence together. We are, we are poised at the edge of scaphalonate dissociation. <laughs> It's the most commonly recognized pattern of carpal instability, known predisposition for degenerative joint disease as a long-term sequelum. And uh, as a, a, a baseline premise, we really do need to understand the anatomy mechanics as a prerequisite for, uh, for management. When we look at the carpus, we understand that uh, uh, the, the hand is made up of a series of arches and the carpus contributes to that through the transverse arch of the, of the carpal tunnel. But often we don't recognize that there's an arch in the coronal plane as well, that the scaphoid and the triquetrum extend distal to the lunate. And so we really have essentially the makings of a three-dimensional arch. And this is very reminiscent to the, uh, uh, to the handlebars on a uh, child's tricycle, if you think about the shape of the, the handlebars. This is what the, the proximal carpal row looks like uh, in terms of its three-dimensional uh, uh, arch shape. And part of that arch, as a classic Roman arch, has two columns that are connected by the archway. And at the apex of that uh, archway is what we call the keystone. And the keystone is a trapezoidal shaped structure that basically takes on those lateral forces that are, that are constantly present trying to uh, collapse that archway. And if we look at the shape of the lunate bone, indeed we'll see, three-dimensionally again, we'll see that the lunate is shaped exactly like a keystone in the proximal row arch, both in the transverse as well as in the coronal planes. So we essentially have the makings then of a three-dimensional keystone. 
Well, what is it that holds these structures together? Uh, uh, not only the shapes of the bones, but also the intrinsic and extrinsic ligaments that connect the bones. And the scaphalunate and lunotriquetral interosseous ligaments um, are, the, are the first line or the primary stabilizers of the proximal rope. And they're both similar in the sense that they are C-shaped. Uh, there is a dorsal, a proximal, and a palmar region uh, for both SL and LT interosseous ligaments. The distal surface is free to communicate with the midcarpal joint. There's no ligament connecting the scaphoid to the lunate to the triquetrum on the distal surface at all. It's free to communicate. We find that not only are there geographic differences uh, or distinctions in these ligaments, but there are also histologic uh, distinctions in these ligaments. If we, again, here we are, we're taking apart the carpus, we're taking out the scaphoid so that we can look at the uh, scaphalonate interosseous ligament from this perspective. So we're seeing the, uh, this must be a pointer. Yeah, this is the uh, lunate, uh, this is the scaphalonate interosseous ligament, and this is the radius after doing a, uh, a fairly radical radial styloidectomy. Uh, when we, <laughs> you know, <laughs> When we look at the histology of these ligaments, what's really interesting is that although the, it looks like a ligament, uh, and you'd think that a ligament is a ligament is a ligament, but it's not. The dorsal and the palmar regions of the scaphalonate interosseous ligament are actually true ligaments. They have collagen fibers that are bundled into fascicles. Those fascicles are surrounded by what we call a perifascicular space. The perifascicular space has nerves and arteries and veins, and then it's all surrounded by uh, a, a synovial lining on the joint side and a fibrous lining on the, uh, on the superficial side. So it's a ligament. The proximal region, even though it looks the same, is composed of fibrocartilage. And that fibrocartilage does not have collagen fibers bundled into fascicles. It doesn't have nerve, doesn't have artery, doesn't have veins, no synovial lining. It's fibrocartilage, just like you'd see in a meniscus or any other structure. Uh, so why fibrocartilage? Well, it's avascular, so it has limited healing, so that's not going to help us with scaphalunate or lunotriquetral dissociation. Since it's fibrocartilage, it undergoes age-related degeneration. Uh, there's no role in proprioception because there's no nerve. Uh, the possible role is maybe it's a biological barrier between the radiocarpal and midcarpal joints just to separate them so each has less volume. It may be a pressure barrier because a lot of joints are stabilized in part by a vacuum. The shoulder joint has essentially a vacuum. There's a negative pressure inside the shoulder. Just put a needle in it and you hear a pss when you put the needle in. And, and you can actually see the, see the uh, glenohumeral joint shift a little bit when you put a needle in it. So maybe that's one of the roles. It's a load-bearing structure. That's what fibrocartilage does. So again, it's nonlinear collagen, so it's non-tensile. This is not a component of scaphalonate or lunotriquetral dissociation. It, it doesn't contribute to that. It, therefore, it's non-tensile, so it must be compression. And if it's compression, there must be load transmission with that. And I think that we've got an explanation theoretically of why that load transmission would occur. Again, if we look at the arches, we see that the, that the loads that go across the wrist are, are generated either by direct pressure or extrinsic tendons that are pulling, the, the, the wrist extensors and the flexors, all the digital flexors and extensors. They're pulling the hand into the forearm. And there's a reactive force that's pushing back against that when we have equilibrium. And that reactive force is created simply by the static structures of the radius and the ulna. When we look at this uh, uh, situation as an arch, its tendency is going to collapse. That's what arches do if they're not stabilized, and that's why it's so important to have that keystone in that, in that arch. And we see that the bulk of the loads are going to happen through the scaphoid and the triquetrum. Those are the columns of the arch. That's where those longitudinal forces are going to be uh, uh, transmitted. As those forces are transmitted, they create a bending moment of the scaphoid and the, and the triquetrum relative to the lunate. Again, it's attempt to collapse the arch by displacing that keystone. And in doing so, uh, what we'll see is that at a very close level, we're going to see that there's going to be compression proximally and tension distally. Everybody getting that? So there's compression proximally and tension distally. Well, where do we find the ligaments and where do we find the, uh, uh, the fibrocartilage? We find the ligaments are distal and the fibrocartilage is the proximal region. So it makes perfect sense that there is a compression 
resisting structure on the proximal surface of the scaphoid and lunate and the lunate and the triquetrum. And the tensile bearing uh, part is going to be distal, which is where those forces exist. So now that we went down that theoretical pathway, which is probably going to have nothing to do with what we do clinically, it's just important that we understand, uh, I, I think, some of, the, some of the subtleties of what we do. Let's take a look at what actually happens from a mechanical standpoint when we develop scaphalunate dissociation. Uh, the dorsal region of the scaphalunate interosseous ligament is thick. It has transversely oriented fibers, and it's usually between uh, anywhere between 3 and 5 millimeters thick. It's big. The volar region of the lunotriquetral ligament has the same structure, but notice they're opposite. The palmar region of the scaphalunate interosseous ligament is thin. It's only one to two millimeters thick, uh, but it, it, it courses obliquely between the scaphoid and the lunate, and the dorsal region of the lunotriquetral ligament is thin, but it's truly a ligament. So again, we've got polar opposites. And again, the proximal region is fibrocartilage in both, and the distal surface is free in both to communicate with the midcarpal joint. The other important ligaments uh, uh, in terms of the, uh, the scaphalonate dissociation are the dorsal capsular ligaments. The, the, uh, uh, there are two of them, uh, so they're easy to remember, the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, which goes between the radius, uh, particularly on the ulnar aspect of the uh, Lister's tubercle all the way over to the sigmoid notch. It has an attachment to the lunate, but it terminates in the dorsal tubercle of the triquetrum. The dorsal intercarpal uh, ligament also originates off of that same dorsal tubercle of the triquetrum and spans the midcarpal joint to attach to the scaphoid and the, uh, and the uh, uh, dorsal cortex of the trapezoid. There are no direct connections between the radius and the scaphoid dorsally. Uh, the, it's this indirect pathway from the uh, dorsal radiocarpal ligament to the dorsal intercarpal ligament. Think about it. If you had a ligament that was stabilizing the scaphoid to the radial, uh, uh, to the radius, uh, it would be active in one position, and that would be terminal flexion. Whatever position that ligament becomes taut in, that's terminal flexion. You can't go any further than that, and if you're less than terminally flexed, the ligament would be redundant. It wouldn't be doing anything. But uh, Steve Viegas did a beautiful job of defining how these two ligaments interact to form an indirect, uh, uh, essentially isometric stabilization of the scaphoid uh, uh, by virtue of their pathway through the triquetrum. This is a cadaver that all the non-ligamentous capsule has been dissected off. Uh, so all we have, uh, we have exposed the, uh, the radius on both of these. It's the same cadaver. One on the left is uh, uh, photographed in extension. The one on the right is in flexion. We also have the scaphoid that's exposed. And again, notice there's no direct uh, uh, ligament connection between the radius and the scaphoid. And we have our two ligaments. And notice that between extension and inflection, these two ligaments form an acute to essentially a right angle. They adapt to the degree of flexion by, by virtue of the intersecting angle between these two ligaments. And that's how they stabilize the, the scaphoid by attaching to the distal aspect of the scaphoid throughout the range of flexion extension. They allow this magnificent range of motion, but the scaphoid is stabilized to the radius by virtue of these two ligaments opening and closing their angle. But it's contingent upon the presence of, a, of an intact scaphalunate interosseous ligament. And you can see on the right side how the scaphoid tends to subluxate out of its scaphoid fossa, even with all these things intact. All right, so it's totally dependent upon the scaphalunate interosseous ligament. And if that's divided, there's nothing preventing the scaphoid from subluxating dorsally out of that scaphoid fossa. And that's where we end up with the scaphalunate dissociation, in spite of that distal uh, uh, stabilization of the, of the scaphoid. Does that part make sense? Okay. So in terms of the kinematics, uh, it's very complex, but there are ways of simplifying it so that we can actually use that information. And Dave Lickman came up with a ring concept, which I think really holds very well. Uh, he's divided the carpus into two rows, the proximal and the distal row, and there's a radial and an ulnar link, and we'll talk about uh, uh, what the functional implications of that are. The distal row, uh, composed of four bones, behaves as a unit. We might as well have a single bone because they, all the bones track together. There's less than five degrees of mutual displacement under load between these bones. I don't know why we have four bones out there. Uh, you know, we, like I say, we could have only one. Maybe it's because there's 
on the design table, uh, uh, you know, we we were part of, uh, you know, uh, some kind of an imaginative uh, a plan where we have one arm bone, the humerus, two forearm bones, the radius and the ulna. Uh, if you exclude the pisiform as a sesamoid, we have three proximal row bones, we have four distal row bones, and five metacarpals. Yeah, so it's kind of a nice arithmetic progression, and I'm, I'm glad it's not geometric. We'd be finned fish or something at, uh, uh, out there. Uh, but essentially, the distal row moves with the hand. So as the hand flexes, so does the distal row. As the hand ulnar deviates, so does the distal row. And it all rotates around a, a cluster of axes of rotation that are roughly centered in, this, in the uh, head of the capitate. The proximal row, though, is different. It has, it's like a kinematic chain. There's motion between the bones of the proximal row. It's like, a, it's like a train going down a track. It's all going in the same direction, but there's motion between the, uh, uh, between the cars. Anybody that's gone from car to car on a, on a subway will, uh, will be able to sense that motion. And you can have over 20 degrees of mutual displacement between the carpal bones during different phases of motion. In flexion and extension, the proximal row moves in general with the hand. So as the hand flexes, so does the proximal row. As the hand extends, so does the proximal row. There's, there is a, uh, a, a confluent motion between the proximal and distal rows. That doesn't occur during radial and ulnar deviation. The proximal row continues to flex and extend as the hand radially and ulnarly deviates. In radial deviation, the proximal row tends to flex and in ulnar deviation, the proximal row tends to extend, and we call that conjunct rotation. So what does that mean? Under normal conjunct rotation, the proximal row is going to flex during radial deviation of the wrist and flexion of the wrist. The difference between radial and ulnar deviation, therefore, occurs primarily in the mid-carpal joint. The proximal row is behaving the same. The difference is what the, what the capitate and the hamate are doing relative to the proximal row during, uh, during a wrist flexion. Because under both uh, flexion and radial deviation, the proximal row flexes. The opposite happens during wrist extension and ulnar deviation. The proximal row tends to extend. So in ulnar deviation or wrist extension, the proximal row extends. The difference between those two hand motions or wrist motions is in the mid-carpal joint. What happens between the proximal and the distal rows? And in addition to that, there are axial displacements. I found this during my doctoral work, uh, that, that as we tend to move into extension, there's a displacement of pronation and supination that occurs between the scaphoid and the lunate, so that they tend to separate on their volar aspect. The scaphoid tends to supinate, the lunate tends to pronate as we move into extension. Okay. This is the point where I need to emphasize we're building a picture here. We're, we're, we're putting together a Pictionary puzzle. You know, where we're looking at the, at the anatomy of the ligaments, we're looking at the displacement of the carpal bones, and ultimately uh, getting to the material properties. So there's that separation between the scaphoid and the lunate in extension. Kinetics, 80% of the load of the wrist under normal circumstances flows through the radial aspect of the wrist. That's both in the mid-carpal joint as well as the radiocarpal joint. So the preponderance of load that occurs, whether it's a, a, a gravity-induced load or if it's a, a, a tendon-induced load, is, is through the radial aspect of the wrist. So we have to consider this a load-bearing joint. Even though we may not be weight-bearing, we're load-bearing because of the activities that we do with that, uh, with that hand. And any action of the extrinsic tendons applies load. When we look at those three same subregions of the scaphalunate ligament, and you can see the same thing with the lunotraquitral ligament, except it's the polar opposite. But we see that the dorsal region of the scaphalunate uh, interosseous ligament is the strongest. And it, is, it constrains translation. So if the scaphoid tends to translate dorsally, it's the dorsal region of the scaphalunate ligament that constrains that. The palmar region is much thinner, you remember that, from the, uh, uh, from the anatomy. It has about a third of the strength of the dorsal region, but it's still important, it's still a ligament. It constrains uh, rotation, both flexion and extension as well as um, uh, pronation and supination. And when this is on an Instrom machine, we're trying to pull the ligaments apart, that fibrocartilage region doesn't contribute at all. We have to cradle the specimen to the uh, machine in order for it to uh, stay together enough for us to test it. So this is clearly a compressive and not a tensile bearing structure. 
The constraint properties, again, when we look at these, uh, demonstrate that the dorsal region is important for strength. It's what prevents the diastasis, or diastasis, depending upon what part of the country you're from, uh, and, and the dorsal translation of the scaphoid. The palmar region is responsible for strength, but it constrains flexion extension and pronation and supination. Now, in order to conserve RAM space in, in our brains, uh, uh, think again of the lunate as being the opposite. All you have to do is memorize one of these, and the lunotriquetral is the opposite. So in the lunotriquetral joint, the volar region is the strongest. It constrains translation. In a scaphalunate dissociation, if you see that the triquetrum is proximal to the lunates because the volar region of the, of the lunotriquetral ligament has been disrupted. If the two bones are rotated, it's the dorsal region that's responsible for that. So just memorize one, and, 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 the, and the other is the opposite. It's, to me, one of the easiest ways to uh, contribute to, uh, to sanity is just to be able to uh, reduce the amount of uh, opposing facts that we have. And the proximal region is fibrocartilage. It's uh, involved in compression and probably behaves more as a meniscus than, than anything. So don't worry about the proximal part when you're looking at somebody with scaphalonic dissociation. It's not contributing to the uh, stability of that joint. So the proximal row uh, behaves in kind of a pre-stressed fashion because the scaphoid is going to tend to palmar flex. And why does it tend to palmar flex? Any load on the scaphoid will tend to uh, palmar flex it. And that's because the distal surface of the scaphoid articulates in a plane that's palmar to the proximal surface. The scaphotrapezium joint is palmar to the radioscaphoid joint. So any extrinsic load is going to generate a rotation moment for flexion. So the scaphoid tends to flex. On the other side, the triquetrum tends to extend. And this is because of a helicoid geometry of, the, of both the, the, the pole of the hamate and the distal surface of the triquetrum, so that as you go into ulnar deviation or extension, the triquetrum engages the the, or the uh, hamate engages the triquetrum and rolls it into extension. So the scaphoid flexes, the triquetrum extends, and the lunate is along for the right. Okay? If everything is intact, the scaphalunate and the lunotriquetral ligaments are good, and everything is positioned well, the lunate is just going to follow what the predominant direction of displacement of its neighboring bones is going to be. So what happens then if we divide the scaphalunate interosseous ligament? We now have dissociated the scaphoid from the triquetrum. Okay? And so what happens to the what happens to the scaphoid when you put load on it? Flexes. What happens to the triquetrum when you put load on it? It extends. So this is opposite motion. The lunate still connected to the triquetrum via the intact lunotriquetral interosseous ligament will tend to go into a dorsiflexion position. So the scaphoid flexes, the lunate and the triquetrum extend. Those supporting ligaments on the, on the dorsal side that we uh, looked at, the uh, radiocarpal and intercarpal ligaments dorsally, if you, if you detach the dorsal intercarpal ligament from the dorsal horn of the lunate with this, that's where you really get the DC deformity, the dorsal intercalated segment instability. Okay, so that's, that's where basically the basic mechanics of, of uh, scaphalunic dissociation comes from. The opposite happens with LT. You divide the lunate. What happens, to, again, what happens to the scaphoid? It's, it's no longer counterbalanced by the triquetrum. It's going to flex. The triquetrum is going to extend, but the lunate is now still connected to the uh, scaphoid, and it's going to be pulled into flexion with the scaphoid, especially if we divide the dorsal radiocarpal ligament off of the dorsal horn of the lunate letting that lunate fall into flexion. And that is the, the, the core of understanding DC versus VC. Intercalated segment, that's a term that Landsmere introduced. All it means is the lunate in a lateral x-ray in a standard position. Is it dorsiflexed or palmar flexed? Because we cannot will our lunate into any position. I have no conscious control over my lunate. All right, <laughs> it's, 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 it's rogue, okay? It, uh, it'll go wherever it wants to. All the motors that we have are, are, are inserting distally, right? 
So the position of the lunate is dependent upon the loads that it's uh, seeing, the shape of the, of the joint surfaces, the shape of the bo bones, and the integrity of the interosseous ligaments. And so all we're doing here is just looking at the position of that intercalated segment relative to the rest of the carpus as a function of um, uh, the status of the surrounding ligaments. Does that make sense? Okay. So what happens when you get a scaphalonic dissociation? Mayfield and Johnson uh, at the University of Wisconsin did a series of experiments where they potted a cadaver forearm and a wrist uh, in cement and dropped bowling balls on it. And uh, I looked at different positions of the, uh, 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 of, the, of the wrist and see what damage happens. And they found that in a position of wrist dorsiflexion and ulnar deviation and a little intercarpal supination, they got one of two results. They either got a scaphoid fracture or a scaphalonic dissociation consistently. So wrist extension and ulnar deviation with a little bit of supination. And that's, uh, that's the position that, that was highly predisposed to scaphalonic dissociation, the classic fouche, okay? So why does that happen? Well, you remember back in a position of extension and ulnar deviation, the proximal row is extended, right? In both of those positions, extension and ulnar deviation. So if you combine extension and ulnar deviation, that locks that proximal row as much as possible into an end stage position. There's no further give. If you look at the position in isolation of extension or ulnar deviation, that locks the joint, but you do them both, that super locks that radiocarpal relationship. So those bones are at their end point of stability. You also remember that in the position of extension, the scaphoid and the lunate tend to separate with pronation and supination. So in that position of extension and ulnar deviation, we not only have the bones locked, but now they're really feeling strain on their volar aspect, right? Because the scaphoid tends to supinate, the lunate tends to pronate, and, they, and, and we've got this, this tension on the volar aspect of the ligament. What stabilizes that? The palmar radio, uh, or the palmar scaphalonate interosseous ligament. That little one millimeter thick band of tissue that ruptures at about 100 newtons, one third the force of the dorsal region. So it's under maximum strain, and yet it's probably one of the weakest links that we have to actually stabilize that joint. And again, if we look at the proximal inter or the uh, scaphalonate interosseous ligament regionally, Again, remember now, the dorsal and the volar regions are composed of true ligaments, collagen fibers, uh, uh, fascicles, blood vessels, et cetera. And the proximal region is not built for tensile load. It's fibrocartilage. So what happens with scaphalunate dissociation is typically the rupture begins in the volar or the palmar region of the scaphalunate interosseous ligament. It propagates like a hot knife through butter through that fibrocartilage proximal region and then terminates with either rupture or plastic deformation of the, of the dorsal region of the scaphalunate uh, interosseous ligament. It's a consistent pattern. Again, it's the opposite if you think about LT. The only difference there is that it's in radial deviation that we tend to see lunotriquetral dissociation, but still that same phenomenon. And the final product of the acute injury then is rupture of the entire scaphalunate interosseous ligament. And that means there's loss of the proximal support of the scaphoid. The scaphoid is stabilized distally, both on its dorsal surface with that dorsal radiocarpal intercarpal ligament V-like structure, but also on the uh, a volar region as well, which is the uh, 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 radioscaphal capitate ligament uh, or attaching to the scaphoid. The proximal pole of the scaphoid is floating on this labrum of the, of the palmar joint capsule. There's nothing that attaches directly to the scaphoid from the radius, proximally. It's all distal. So when you lose that scaphalunate interosseous ligament, you lose any control of the scaphoid. And it'll tend to still flex, but instead of flexing by dropping the distal pole anteriorly, it flexes by subluxating the proximal pole out dorsally. So the proximal pole of the scaphoid comes out of the scaphoid fossa dorsally. Scaphoid still flexes. It's just that it shifts the axis of rotation from proximal to distal. And that results then in malrotation of the scaphoid. Here you can see that. You see where the scaphoid is actually subluxated out of the scaphoid fossa here? 
And that also then results in the malrotation of the lunate, that dorsal intercalated segment uh, uh, instability. And what that then also allows is the capitate can, uh, again, we'll see here, it's a load-bearing structure, so we've got all this load still going across the wrist, 80% of it through the scaphalunate region. And the, there's a dorsal and a proximal translocation of the capitate. And this leads to carpal collapse, where the proximal distal uh, ratio or the length of the carpus is, is altered. There's a progressive decrease in the contact areas and altered kinematics with sustained load. And then ultimately, this is what I believe uh, leads to the, uh, the stages of scaphalunate advanced collapse degenerative disease, the slack wrist. So with that, uh, again, I, I hope I didn't overlap too much with, uh, with our subsequent presentations, but, but do you see what I mean about you know, understanding what the normal anatomy and normal mechanics of the joint are by taking a clinical scenario and then decomposing it? Y'all probably think I'm standing up here decomposing myself, but, but you, you, you decompose that into the fundamental elements. Uh, and, and we suddenly begin to, re we, we begin to understand what are, the, what are those, those key elements that keep us together, keep our joint moving, and that's what we achieve to, uh, or that's what we aspire to achieve with the treatment of our, uh, uh, of our patients with this uh, very common condition. So thank you very much for your attention. I, I bet I went over, I apologize. Thank you. Okay, so now on to, uh, that, uh, Dr. Berger gave an excellent um, overview, or not just an overview, a very uh, good detailed presentation on the anatomy, concentrating on the scaphalunate uh, uh, joint, which I think dovetails nicely with uh, mine, uh, with my presentation, which is on scaphalunate instability. Uh, I'm Jeff Friedrich, uh, I like to tell people I'm not a real doctor, I'm a plastic surgeon, uh, and so I'm gonna be talking on this, uh, this somewhat vexing problem um, and, and I won't belabor the anatomy, although you could argue that this is number two of your 13 repetitions to, uh, to get this stuff. But uh, the scaphoid and the lunate make, uh, with the triquetra, make that proximal carpal row. And you can see here the, um, I, I think just the names of the two bones themselves are, are pretty neat. The, you know, lunate means moon, and so it's kind of a crescent, like a half moon. And we used to call the scaphoid the navicular, but there's also a navicular in the foot, and we want nothing to do with the foot. So <laughs> we, we left them with the navicular. I still, still hear that occasionally, and I think that's probably an appropriate uh, term, but we may turn our nose up at it. But the scaphoid is sort of, uh, it's very apropos because it means boat-shaped, and it, and it really is. You can see that it's, uh, it's kind of boat-shaped. Not necessarily a, a very uh, seaworthy boat, but uh, it's boat shaped. And then there's the, uh, the, the, the other side of that scaphalunate construct that we've removed during a proximal row carpectomy. Uh, these slides, I've never seen them before. Um, <laughs> they're actually borrowed from Dr. Berger, so uh, I, I won't belabor this other than uh, to restate that it is indeed a three-dimensional arch, not just in the coronal plane, but also in the, uh, in the axial plane, and that's what you know, lends us that stability although, as Dr. Berger said, we're right on the precipice often uh, with that stability. Ligamentous anatomy is uh, obviously what really we're talking about here. We're talking about anatomy and patho-anatomy of the scaphoelinate uh, or the ligaments around this joint. Um, when we're talking about ligaments in the wrist, when we say intrinsic, that means within the carpal bones. And one example of that that we're obviously talking about here is the scaphoelinate interosseous ligament. Uh, and it's, as uh, Dr. Berger said, a C-shaped ligament and, for the most part, more substantial dorsally, although it has a pretty substantial volar component. And again, you've already seen these uh, with these excellent cutaways of the scaphalonate uh, joint and then the scaphoid removed. And you can see that uh, just little cup of ligament uh, that forms the scaphalonate ligament. Uh, here it is on its proximal aspect. Again, it's, uh, uh, this is in the normal variant rather than the, in the abnormal, obviously. And again, it forms that C shape where the distal surface is free. And uh, again, there's no ligamentous connection between the lunate and the capitate. Uh, 
uh, because there really doesn't, for the most part, doesn't need to be. Other stabilizers, now, uh, I say here, this is not a, this is not a hard and fast state statement. Cutting the SLIL alone doesn't necessarily lead to in SL instability. SL instability is not black and white. There are gradations of that, and so you can have a cut SLIL uh, and not necessarily be as symptomatic as other people are with, you know, clunks and uh, outright instability. Uh, and we'll talk about that in, in terms of the staging. There are extrinsic stabilizers, um, and so that's what extrinsic means is they're not ligaments between carpal bones. They go from uh, forearm bones to carpal bones, and that constitutes extrinsic ligaments. Uh, some of those stabilizers are the radioscaphal captate ligament, volarly, and the dorsal ligaments uh, mentioned before, the dorsal radiocarpal and dorsal intercarpal. Um, this is a palm review uh, of, the, uh, of the wrist. You can see that uh, radioscaphal captate ligament forms half of an arch going across the volar aspect of the joint, and that uh, really stabilizes the scaphoid, especially uh, on the volar aspect. Uh, this is another view. This, this picture, I, I, this is a beautiful picture, but it's a little bit confusing. This is the the distal radius and then the scaphoid and lunate here, and then you can see this uh, radioscaphal capitate ligament, which is on the volar side. It's a little bit uh, disorienting to see that. Uh, again, as mentioned, the dorsal ligaments, uh, including the dorsal radiocarpal and the dorsal intercarpal, form that accordion-like stabilizer of the scapholunate uh, joint, because this, if it was just a straight ligament, we'd just have not much wrist flexion at all. Uh, so it, it is pretty an, an, a, a pretty amazing construct. Um, I, the carpal kinematics have been mentioned. I'll just briefly say how they move. There's, again, it, it's, it's pretty amazing because there's no tendinous attachments uh, to the proximal carpal row uh, from the forearm. But to repeat, the scaphoid's tendency is to flex. The triquetrum's tendency is to extend. And then the lunate goes with, you know, with whoever has the better offer, so to speak. Um, and hold your applause for my excellent drawing here of the uh, radiocarpal joint. Um, you know, one of the, I, I only put this very rudimentary drawing here because I, I really like this coiled spring analogy and it helps me remember what's happening and what wants to happen with the, with the wrist joint, specifically the proximal carpal row. If you think of that, those three bones like a spring, um, and there's tension being put on the one end uh, there's an extension force on the ulnar side, on the tri triquetrum, and a flexion force on the scaphoid side. If you take a spring that's under that tension and you cut it in one part, it, it's going to pretty dramatically, uh, the two ends pr snap away from each other. And so say we cut the spring here between the scaphoid and the lunate, and now that scaphoid's going to pr uh, pretty significantly flex, and the lunate and the triquetrum will then significantly extend. So for me, this is a, I, I, I need pretty uh, concrete and simple analogies uh, to help me understand, and that's one that, um, that's one that I like. Uh, so the carpal motion, the scaphoid, uh, with wrist flexion and radial deviation, it flexes, and with wrist extension and older deviation, it extends, and that becomes important when we're diagnosing this problem. And the lunate, again, it's kind of a dumb bone. It's, it's along for the ride. If the SLIL is disrupted, then that triquetrum wants to pull it into extension, leading to the DISI or the DC deformity, as mentioned before. Um, <clears throat> and so this is what happens very in a schematic format with scaphalinate dissociation. We're looking at the volar aspect of the wrist. Um, and so you can see the scaphoid on the right here is flexing, and the lunate and the triquetrum are extending, and the the capitate then tends to slide down along the back uh, aspect of that cup of the lunate. What you see sometimes on radiographs, uh, and I'll talk about the radiographic um, uh, sort of criteria, uh, are demonstrated here. There's a widening of the scaphalunate uh, interval, uh, and the scaphoid just does not look normal. It looks shorter uh, because it's flexed down, and now we're x-raying along its axis rather than a standing up scaphoid. So the diagnosis uh, for the problem, diagnosis of scaphalunate instability in particular, um, ha, uh, there are several ways to get at it. Uh, obviously, we want to talk to the patient. They'll give you a lot of clues about um, how the problem happened and, and what is going on. 
some have a wrist injury, and I've had other patients with bilateral scapholoid instability that swear up and down to me that they've never had a wrist injury. So it's not a hard and fast prerequisite, I think, but often people will relay, you know, a football injury that they just taped or, or some other injury that they kind of, you know, walked off, so to speak. Uh, they can have wrist pain, especially with grip and wrist extension, uh, and some have clunking and popping, others don't. Again, you don't have to have a clunk uh, to, for it to be scaphoid instability because there's various uh, gradations of it. On physical exam, they, they can often have tenderness over the radial side of the wrist or specifically over the scaphoid. Uh, and there can be laxity when you, uh, if we grab the, the scaphoid and the lunate and kind of move them dorsally and volarly, it can be lax, that scaphoid lunate belotment, that can be another clue. The Watson test gets mentioned pretty often. Um, and th there's, it's a two-part test. Basically, the examiner starts on the left. You put a thumb on the distal pull of the scaphoid and push and have the wrist ulnarly deviated. And then you move it back into radial deviation and continue pushing on the scaphoid. And if it's positive, that's the proximal pull of the scaphoid slips off the back of the radius, which hurts. And so usually it makes a clunk. And people will get mad at you and say, ow. Um, so that's the Watson scaphoid shift test. So now we've examined the patient and we move on to radiographs and again looking for more evidence. There are signs including scaphoid widening or the distance between the two bones gets wider. It's very important I think to compare with the other side because um, these aren't absolute numbers, these are relative numbers uh, depending on the patient. There's disruption of Galula's lines. Dr. Galula was a radiologist who described these two concentric arcs of the wrist on the uh, AP film between the proximal row and the uh, mid-carpal row. And if those are no longer concentric circles, then, then that's a clue that there's some sort of carpal problem. The scaphoid ring sign, which I'll show you in a minute, and then there, there can be degenerative signs if it uh, has progressed far enough. So in terms of the radiographic signs, uh, the books will say a scaphoid gap of two millimeters, or greater than two millimeters. Again, I think it's not so much uh, important that it's two millimeters as that it's relatively increased from the patient's other side. This has been anecdotally referred to as the Terry Thomas sign. Apparently, he is a British comedian that no one in this room knows. Um, <laughs> so it, that's always been vexing to me, and so I, I think you know, this is America by God, uh, so we need, uh, we need someone who's a good, strong American. So if any of you remember Leon Spinks, who is former heavyweight champion of the world and a Marine Corps veteran and a, and a good American, um, he had greater than a two millimeter gap. <laughs> so I, I am lobbying, I, and I have, you know, lobbying to change it to the Leon Spinks sign because we need to put our American stamp on this. Um, so uh, there can be a gap there. And, and the other thing that I'll, I'll ask you to notice is, again, these Galula's lines, those concentric arcs of the wrist are no longer uh, concentric circles. So the mid-carpal row has a circle here, but this is not a circle. It kind of gets flat and then becomes circular again. So those lines have been disrupted. Um, Another, here's another, uh, this is a patient of mine with a widened SL joint, although you look at it and go, well, it's not crazy wide. But one thing you also notice is that scaphoid ring sign, when the scaphoid is bent down more, uh, the x-ray is now shooting up the length of the scaphoid, and so it's looking more like a circle than, a, uh, than like a kidney uh, or a kidney bean. And so you see the ring of the distal pull of the scaphoid because now the scaphoid is bent down more. Uh, on the lateral x-ray, uh, you'll see that that lunate is tipped dorsally and the scaphoid is still a little bit extended but not much and so the angle between the two of those gets quite a bit smaller. But it's important to look at the other side so if I just look at it, you know, just looked at that um, on the one side you think well it's, it's somewhat wide but it's not hugely widened and then you look at the control out and you go well that's a little bit widened too but it and often you can get them uh, ask, have the patient get a grip x-ray and that will again force that scaphoid and the lunate apart and then you can see the real difference and so I, in my mind it's more a relative widening of the scaphoid lunate inter interval than it is an absolute and, you, and so you can see a definite difference between the, the unaffected non-painful side uh, 
and the affected painful side. You've uh, heard about slack risk. That's basically scapholinate instability that's been allowed to just continue being unstable and continue degenerating. And like anything, we've applied classification systems to that. The first one has narrowing of the radioscaphoid joint at the styloid, and then there's narrowing of the entire radioscaphoid joint, and finally there's midcarpal collapse. So this is a patient that uh, has has moved on to the to the uh, stage two, where the whole joint between the radius and the scaphoid is narrowed, and it looks just very angry. There's osteophytes there, and then that capitate has moved more proximally than it should. So this is scaphoid scaphoid instability at the end of the continuum. Uh, and then this unfortunate patient who swears to me he had no wrist injury whatsoever, had it on both sides, and it, it, was, it was fairly symmetric. So again, uh, just driving home the point that there does not have to be a wrist injury that, uh, that they know of uh, to get a problem with this. So I'm going to talk about uh, treatment, and, and I'm going to go through the whole kind of gamut of treatments here. Um, and it's important, to, it's important to note that there is no single reference standard treatment. And in fact, our treatments, you can argue that there's nothing perfect. Um, all of them have their problems, and this is an issue in hand surgery that we haven't solved, quite honestly, is the, the ideal treatment for scaphalonid instability. Um, so none of these that I'll show you today are ones that I can, you know, honestly recommend one over the other. We all have ones that we like, that we're comfortable doing, uh, but none of them are None of them are superior in my mind, although their devotees will tell you that one is superior over the other. So starting at <clears throat> what is arguably maybe the least invasive, and that is arthroscopy, it's a diagnostic and a therapeutic modality. It allows us to look into the wrist and, and see what, if there is a problem and where it is. It allows visualization of that SL articulation. Uh, like good orthopedic and plastic surgeons, we've classified everything from one to whatever. Uh, and that's no, uh, it's no different with SL instability. There's this Geisler classification for arthroscopic findings of the SL ligament. Um, I, I don't want you to read all of it except for the stuff in blue. So grade two is there's a step off seen in the midcarpal space. Grade three, you can pass a probe between the scaphoid and the lunate. And then finally, uh, on grade four, you can put the whole scope. Uh, between the scaphoid and the lunate. So again, treatments, um, and, and we'll go back to arthroscopy uh, in a minute, but uh, again, there's no reference standard. Um, again, uh, with acute scaphoid instability, uh, it, it's usually, when we see it, it's with a perilunate fracture dislocation uh, and or a distal radius fracture. These aren't readily apparent right away. They don't, they often, it, it takes a little bit of time for that scaphoid and the lunate to kind of drift apart in the acute setting. And so, I, you know, as one of our former fellows used to say, I, I, haven't, this, I haven't seen this much. It may have seen me, but I haven't seen it. Um, and so it's a little bit difficult to detect in the acute phase. Uh, oh, goodness. I have no idea. Sorry. Oh, thank goodness. Um, I, I'll go, I, I don't have a slide on it, but I'll go back to the arthroscopy. And that, that is one treatment. It, not only is it diagnostic, but it can be uh, a treatment modality. And people have proposed for earlier grades of scaphalunate instability this um, thermal shrinkage of the uh, scaphalunate ligament where you uh, put a probe in and heat things up and have it shrink down. Um, there, there's some problems with that because you're intentionally creating an injury. Uh, the theory that the proponents say is that it promotes in, in growth of vascularity and allows um, um, sort of repair of that ligament, uh, but it certainly has its detractors and it's not something that I think is widely uh, being used and, and in some corners is being widely panned. Um, so now uh, I'll go on to show you this is an acute uh, scaphalodin instability of mine. Uh, this patient had a distal radius fracture. Uh, so they rarely occur in isolation. They're usually with a distal radius fracture or, as I said, uh, a perilunate dislocation. Uh, but I'll orient you. This is uh, the distal radius here, scaphoids over here, and this is the lunate. And, and we've done nothing to this other than open up the wrist. And so there's a big Leon Spinks sign uh, there between uh, the scaphoid and the lunate. <laughs> um, 
But the more common situation as we see uh, it, over at Harborview certainly is the perilunate dislocation, which is uh, sort of uh, uh, SL instability to the nth degree. It's not only made the, the scaphalunate articulation unstable, but it's also destabilized the lunotriquetral articulation. And so on the AP x-ray here, you think, well, it's a little bit off. Um, but I, I don't have a lateral x-ray, and I'm sorry, but the, the lunate's frankly dislocated from the rest of the carpus. And so these require acute repair pretty acutely. We like to get off after these intercarpal dislocations uh, fairly quickly, and it's uh, repairing the ligaments and then stabilizing all of those intercarpal articulations against each other so that those ligaments can heal up because they're not, you know, on the cadaveric specimens that we showed you, uh, they look pretty substantial, but in their injured state, they really aren't, and there's not a lot of good stuff to put a bunch of big stitches in. Uh, so we really have to rely on uh, this reduction and holding things in place while it heals up. So the delayed or chronic um, issues, which is, I think, the more common instance in which we're seeing scaphalunate instability, uh, there are therapeutic modalities that uh, Dr. Michaelovitz will uh, go through later. Um, th there is uh, one thing that I think is pretty interesting is this proprioception re-education. And what this diagram is showing you is that um, in the abnormal state, when there's a scaphalunate dissociation, the flexor carpi radialis can pull down, pull proximally, and it forces the back end of the scaphoid out the dorsum of the uh, radioscaphoid joint. Uh, but if you can co-contract the ECRB, which is on the back side of that scaphoid, that can help stabilize that scaphoid and, and prevent the, at least the frank dislocation out of the back side of the radioscaphoid joint. Um, so I, I, I think that's... Um, at least for earlier grades of scaphalunate instability, that, that's uh, pretty promising, especially for patients that you know, would like to do things short of surgery. Um, again, with the arthroscopic I mentioned, we can do debridement and thermal shrinkage. That's usually for grade one or two tears, and it, as I said, theoretically induces ingrowth and contraction, although um, that, that's, I think, debatable. So the surgical reconstructions, now we're at the point where we can no longer repair things primarily and suture things together. We're at the point where we have to provide some sort of substitute uh, for the scaphalunate ligament. And again, we haven't, we haven't found that ideal substitute yet. We're, I, I, you know, we get close with some things, uh, but the ideal is not here yet. Um, one me uh, method that I like is the capsulodesis, uh, where you use part of the dorsal wrist capsule to uh, recreate the, especially the dorsal stabilizers of the joint and stabilize that scaphoid. And here we've taken part of the wrist capsule in this schematic and uh, sutured it to the lunate. You can also um, anchor it to the dorsum of the distal radius too to prevent that proximal aspect of the scaphoid from sliding out dorsally. This is one, uh, uh, a patient of mine that I've done uh, with, uh, with a capsulodesis and that's what the little uh, anchors are, and then the uh, uh, two K-wires stabilizing the scaphalunate joint. And here's the problem with pretty much all scaphalunate uh, reconstructions. So this is her many months later, and she's actually happy and not very pain-free, but she's got this x-ray that looks not unlike it did before surgery. It's a wide SL interval, and the scaphalunate angle on the lateral is still pretty narrow, or the, the difference between them is, is still decreased. And so uh, a lot of these options will lead to repeatedly distressing x-rays if you keep x-raying them, but oftentimes they can, uh, they can get relief from it. Um, part of that relief may be from us cutting the posterior interosseous nerve too as we make our surgical approach. So it, it's, you know, it's really debatable uh, what, what's causing what. Uh, the dorsal soft tissue reconstructions, the impetus for this is what we know from the anatomy talk that Dr. Berger gave, which is, the dorsal aspect of the SLIL is probably the more substantial. And so we're trying to recreate that scaphalunate ligament where it's the strongest. We've used allograft materials and uh, patient's own tissue like a bone ligament bone uh, harvested either from the foot or the dorsum of the radius. Again, these are good, but they're not perfect. And this is an example of one where we've taken the, uh, and I have no uh, financial interest here, but it is a product called Graft Jacket, which is uh, human dermis from a cadaver, and it's been decellularized, and, and we're basically just fixing it to the dorsum of the scaphoid and the lunate uh, to give a, a proxy for that scaphalunate ligament. 
tendon weaves are um, used by a lot of people uh, to, again, recreate uh, the scaphoid interosseous ligament and to stabilize the scaphoid itself. And one of the more popular ones is called the Brunelli weave that you see here on the screen. The, um, the flexor carpi radialis tendon seen here is pushed through a drill hole in the scaphoid. It's brought out the dorsum of the scaphoid and then it's wrapped around uh, uh, other dorsal soft tissue. And here you can see it's been uh, sutured over to the lunate and then brought back on itself. So not only is it stabilizing the distal pull of the scaphoid, but it's attempting to, again, recreate that ligament that's, uh, that's missing. And here's the x-ray of it. And you'll notice we put it, there's a screw across this one. This is one of Dr. Hanel's cases and I'll talk about that screw here in a minute. Um, the screw fixation, it, it's, um, its name that's been popularized is the Rassel screw, um, and it's, that's reduction, assist, a reduction association of the SL joint. Uh, it can be used alone or in combination with other techniques, uh, but it's basically a screw across the scaphoid and the lunate. Um, some people have tried absorbable screws with mixed results for that, so I think most people that do it are using a, basically a metallic screw. And again, that's that same case that I showed you where the, uh, we're really relying on holding the relationship between the scaphoid and the lunate together so that that soft tissue reconstruction can heal up and recapitulate that ligament. Finally, if all else has failed uh, or you find that you know, the patient's not a candidate for these other uh, reconstructions, there are various arthrodeses that have been done um, and, and that basically prevents abnormal scaphoid or lunate motion. Um, and there's various types, the, the STT, the scaphocaptate, and the radio scaphalunate. The, the scaphalunate arthrodesis has been done, but I think most people have panned that because it's, it's got a very high non-union rate and it's, it's, I think, rarely successful. And it has to be a bigger contact area between the bones that you're arthrodesing. This is a schematic of the radio scaphalunate arthrodesis. Um, and uh, basically any motion that's left in the wrist, and there's still some, but it's, it's small, is through that uh, mid-carpal row uh, between the lunate and the captate that you see there. I'll only mention slack wrist treatment briefly. Um, as I said, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's gave for lunate instability at its, at its worst degree, so to speak. Uh, there's fairly limited options for that. Uh, mainly includes a proximal row carpectomy where you just ditch the whole uh, proximal row, although we know that those don't often hold up for a lifetime. They'll hold up for a decade or two, um, but not for a lifetime. And then the, uh, the one that I like is the scaphoidectomy and four-corner arthrodesis. So you remove the scaphoid and, and fuse everything else, and this is that same patient of mine that I showed you. Uh, what we've done here is uh, you're looking at the, um, uh, uh, the wrist after the scaphoid's been removed and there, those four bones, we've taken off the articular surface, we put a plate on it. And then this is what it looks like, it's, it's basically one, they just have one wrist bone now instead of, you know, nine, and that moves against the distal radius and uh, can lead to fairly good outcomes, at least in this patient. Uh, so again, the treatments for um, scaphoid instability, uh, you, you, you will hear devotees of multiple treatments, uh, of individual treatments, but uh, you, know, it, it, it's, you should remain skeptical because we haven't found the ideal treatment yet. And, and I, I'm not sure if we will. We, we may continue arguing amongst ourselves about what is the ideal, but it, it's not here yet. So thank you very much. Go and switch. Uh, thanks, Jeff, for uh, as Dr. Friedrich mentioned, it's a really tough injury that we really don't have a good answer for. Uh, Jeff, actually, I had a quick question for you in the audience. What's your counseling when you talk to a patient with a chronic scapulonia injury, and you're talking about some of the different treatment options and expected outcome? At least in my mind, I <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, I I like to try the uh, non-operative treatments first, especially the uh, the proprioception re-education and, and really try to uh, exhaust all of those treatments before we go to a, a surgical one. And as I said, my go-to, at least for the scaphalonian instabilities, has been the, um, what's affectionately known as the Mayo capsulodesis. As, as a Mayo trainee, I'm contractually apply, uh, obligated to use that. Uh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, and, uh, and then for the slack wrist treatment, I like the, 
scaphoidectomy and a four corner fusion. But it's, you know, I tell them that I, I, I like to exhaust the non operative treatments, and then we have a couple of uh, surgical treatments that, that we can go to. But I, I, it's, I certainly don't paint a rosy picture for them. <laughs> Do you have any questions for Dr. Friedrich uh, from the audience? So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Chris Allen, one of my partners who's practiced out of Harborview. Who was here for the course last year? So unfortunately, I couldn't convince Dr. Allen to do a repeat rendition of the uh, right. musical from last year. It was but. unanimous that it did not need to be done again. <laughs> so this is cool. A lot of times I give a talk about uh, this sort of thing, and I'm squeezing in between like tibia fractures and you know neck pain. But here, you guys are, are really getting the same thing. Uh, you know, almost 13 times. You only need 10 more to perfection after my talk. Uh, I am Chris Allen. Uh, there's been an update of which uh, you are not aware regarding the nomenclature. It's now called the Emily Allen sign. This is my daughter who's down a couple of teeth. No child beating, it's all natural. Um, I am possibly the worst public speaker I have ever heard, and sometimes <laughs> I lose focus. You know, I, I just want somebody to come up here and get, finish the talk for me, so I'm going to make the key points early so that if I start to wander, you will at least have heard them once. Um, the architecture of the wrist is complex and beautiful, and uh, you've seen that. When injured, it fails in predictable ways because of the anatomy. Uh, as you heard from Dr. Friedrich, if I stand back here, can you hear me still? Okay, god darn it. All right, so to add to my discomfort, I'll be leaning forward for the entire duration of the talk. Um, to my knowledge, there is not yet any reliable repair nor reconstruction of the SLIL that makes it work correctly, either overshoot or undershoot, or I do. To overshoot is to basically fuse things, so you just say the hell with it, I'm just going to make it stable, it's not going to hurt, I hope, um, but it's not going to move as it once did. To undershoot is when you try and make it like it used to be perfectly, and you fail, and everything's lax. And you've seen what happens if you do that. You end up with this slack wrist business and arthritis, and then you go back and overshoot and fuse it. Um, so the aim with ORAF, or open reduction internal fixation, of the acute perilunate injury is to hit the sweet spot between these two positions. And we try, as Jeff showed you in one of his slides, to do that uh, by opening up and repairing the ligaments and pinning the bones together where the ligaments used to hold them while we wait for the ligaments to congeal. And I really do think one of the great things about this, uh, the chance to come and talk with you guys, is that I get to hear from you how folks are doing. Uh, walking in here, I heard about a patient. I'm sure at the break I'll hear about some folks. And um, we don't know. We've just told you we don't know. And uh, you guys know more than we do because we see them for three hours in the OR, and you see them for you know three months or <laughs> occasionally three years. Um, <laughs> in the clinic and then I hear back later what worked and what didn't work. So I invite you to come down and tell me what, what recently hasn't worked of mine so that I can try and correct things. And so I really do mean that ongoing discussions between you and us and the patients are probably the best way we're, we're going to drive knowledge forward with what I, I called and I believe really are these massive injuries to the wrist. Um, and I'll talk at the end again, uh, chiefly attending to changes in fixation, especially between scaphoid and lunate as we try to reconstruct that ligament. And then in post-op range of motion, where I have uh, a, a couple of thoughts here stolen, as most of my good ideas are from others. Um, little is known about the true incidence of perilunate dislocations. Many believe, because of the challenges in diagnosing them radiographically, that they may be underdiagnosed. Um, as surgeons, we've all got uh, stories of folks sent in with pain after an injury three months ago, where they were told their films looked normal, and the lunate is still parked out well anterior to the whole rest of the carpus. Um, not a radiologist's finest hour. Prompt open reduction with ligamentous repair or reconstruction is thought necessary to achieve a favorable, favorable result. You can't really just pin these things in closed fashion and hope for them to do well. Most folks do show up acutely, not the, the three months down the line with the normal film uh, history. It's often the fall that Dr. Berger spoke of on an outstretched wrist, and he spoke about this uh, Mayfield and Johnson um, uh, report in 1980. So if you fall down, you're, you're going to tend to, I'll do it, not the whole fall. So you're going to head forward, you're going to roll away, so you get extension, ulnar deviation, and ulnar 
intercarpal supination. So those are the three motions which they showed led to popping through first the, actually we'll skip ahead here. Who wrote this talk? All right, so I'm looking for my cursor, but you see one, two, three, and four. Is there a light thing here? Yeah. You are the man. Okay, stage one, you pop through the SLIL, scaphalunia interosseous ligament, about which you've heard as much as or more than you want to already. There's nothing here, stage two is sort of like um, the hot knife through butter, of which Dr. Berger spoke. Stage three goes to the LT ligament, and with stage four, the lunate pops out, or the whole carpus pops off, and the lunate remains. And we will show you some pictures of these. Uh, so you heard about the center of axis, of, uh, the center of rotation of the carpus being in the head of the capitate, and everything sort of rips off from the radius ulnarward. Sometimes they come in having had this injury, but they've been reduced, and you see just a little styloid fleck off here, and a little styloid fleck off here, and you have to be very suspicious of what's transpired. And so here's another example of those ligaments being torn sequentially. Um, so a fall, motor vehicle accident, they'll have deformity, swelling, tenderness, and you look again at the radiographs, especially the lateral view, and look at the lunate capitate relationship. If that's disrupted, or I should say in a perilunate disruption, that will look abnormal in a very clear and obvious way. You heard about Galula's arcs. Oh yeah, I hear the pages turning. I know you're hating me now because the talk that I'm giving is not exactly what you have in your syllabus. Um, many of the slides are similar. They're in a unique order now, and I'm sorry. Uh, my email is at the end of the talk, and you can yell at me digitally later. Um, so we'll talk about some of these concepts, which are the third but not yet the 13th time you've heard them. So here's Galula's lines. And basically, uh, he's a radiologist, so a very smart man, so he's got three of them. I'm an orthopod, so I had to make it just two. Um, this is one space to look at, the radiocarpal joint, and this is the midcarpal joint, the other space to look at. And if things look good, unfortunately you have to see a couple hundred of these to know what good looks like, then you're happy. If it doesn't look good, you're sad. Um, <laughs> lesser, arc, lesser arc injury. It's great as a speaker to be intentionally funny. It's a little concerning to be unintentionally funny. <laughs> so <laughs> we'll try and keep that to a minimum. Uh, lesser arc injury means just going around the lunate. Greater arc usually blasts through some of the bones as well. I'm not sure why that's important, but there's so many pictures of it in the books from which I stole these pics that I threw them in. You've seen this. Um, in short, with the SLIL out, the lunate tilts dorsal, scaphoid tilts palmar. With the LT ligament out, the lunate follows the triquetrum palmarward and often the scaphoid falls palmarward as well for the reasons Dr. Berger elegantly described and showed. And in perilunate, sort of all bets are off because everything's torn. Uh, here's another example. This is from Tom Trumbull's book. And so uh, DZ, uh, the normal, looking here. Watch also the capitate articulating with the lunate. In DZ, the capitate wants to pop out the back as the lunate tilts. We talk about the spilled teacup and all this business. In VZ, the lunate is now tilting forward. And so you can look at the capitate with respect to the lunate, and the, the most common deformity being the DZ. You see the capitate spitting out the back. And Dr. Berger showed you, you have now the same amount of load across a smaller surface area. So you can imagine that that cartilage wears down preferentially. And so you get arthritis both in the radiocarpal and midcarpal joint. Another example of the same thing. Now you're down to about nine more iterations before you're perfect on this. Uh, this is the carpal height ratio, the book from which I stole this, uh, would have, had I pirated the figure correctly, shown you that the end of the metacarpal is here. This uh, L1 is the length of the third metacarpal. Does not change unless you're hitting people and breaking the bone. This is from the lunate fossa of the radius to the base of the third metacarpal. And over time, if these things are blown apart due to loss of the SL uh, ligament, then the capitate is going to migrate proximally, as Jeff showed, and also in DZ, the lunate is um, kicked up in such a way that the capitate uh, is, less, uh, is closer to the radius because of 
the portion of the lunate, which is now articulating between these two bones, being that narrow dorsal portion. So over time, you can follow the L2 changing, becoming more, uh, becoming smaller, and L1 staying the same, so your carpal height ratio decreases. Another model of the same thing. The beautiful anatomy, which you've seen again for the third time today. Um, the stout ligaments between lunate and its surrounding bones. The 300 newtons are required to bust this guy. Um, 100 newtons or less are required to separate any of the other ligaments in the wrist, with the except of the volar portion of the LT. So it takes a lot to injure this, and yet it happens not infrequently, as you've heard. Uh, we'll talk briefly, only very briefly, because it's not as important, I think, as the ligamentous anatomy, about the vascular supply. And the key points here are the scaphoid has a poor uh, blood supply, and it's shown in this cartoon. It comes off distal and then tries to migrate proximally, but um, these very interesting latex injection studies show that it doesn't quite get there. So you have the distal pole and the waist and the proximal pole, and this business here is poorly supplied, and the significance is if you break the scaphoid, you are necessarily disrupting these blood vessels, and this guy may not do well. You've all seen and heard of AVN, and that can be a consequence of a transcaphoid perilunate injury. Interestingly, the lunate, which is often spat out the front, uh, retains blood supply through the short radiolunate ligament, which Dr. Berger has uh, shown elegantly in a number of studies, and that does um, allow for a, a transient loss of blood supply, radiographically identifiable by uh, increased opacity, but over time that seems to recover almost all the time. Scaphoid, not so much. Uh, so this area here, good blood flow. This area here, not so much. So we try and reduce these uh, in order to bring about union. Uh, calls to Newcastle indeed. So you've seen this, again, another 10 times, and you can write the talk. Um, front side, this we didn't show you. This is the space of Poirier, so this is the volar aspect of the wrist. As everything else tears, the lunate can pop out through this relative weak spot in the volar capsule. I learned to say volar from Jeff. I used to call it volar, but I feel educated to a higher extent now. Or perhaps the guys at what Case Western in Cincinnati would not like that, but they're not here, so the heck with them. All right, same picture again. This, we d you haven't seen this before. This is that helicoid joint of which Dr. Berger spoke. And uh, Dave Lichtman actually was my fellowship director. So I love this joint. Um, this he used to describe as sort of a roller coaster. And the point that he was making was that the static load that your extrinsic flexors and extensors apply across this joint does want to kick the proximal carpal row into extension. So you heard about that. And you heard that when this SL ligament is destroyed, the lunate and the triquetrum remain united, and they go into extension. Don't need to repeat that except for another 10 more times. So the, the ring model is Dave Lichtman's um, favorite of the models describing carpal kinematics. And this, I really do think I'm gonna not pound you on the head with this further. A uh, Couple of cartoons to that effect. Radial deviation, scaphoid flexes. You see the proximal, uh, the distal pole coming proximally. And this is a lateral view showing the scaphoid flexing with radial deviation. Ulnar deviation, the reverse happens. The helicoid triquetral hamate joint kicking things into extension. The lunate following along, uh, lazy bone that it is. And so this is ulnar deviation, standing the scaphoid up right here, and uh, now faking you out, showing Palmer to the right for a change. The scaphoid standing up here relative to the lunate. But wait! So um, Scott Wolf and jo Joseph Crisco, <laughs> I was going to call him Joe as if I've ever met him. Um, have come up with a great idea, which I think holds true, and they go back to anthropological um, work from uh, earlier primates, showing A, the power grip, and B, the precision or baseball grip, and this uh, modified power grip. If you pick up a hammer and pound, we always talk about the six motions being supination, pronation, flexion, extension, and radial and ulnar deviation, but really, it, pick up something now and, and pound, and you're doing a combination of things. You're going from radial deviation and extension to ulnar deviation and flexion. So they've called this the dart thrower's motion, I guess because the, you know, the, the pound motion doesn't sound as elegant. Uh, and so if this is a racket or a hammer, if you try that yourself, you can't really call it true uh, 
flexion. It's a combination, as they've pointed out. And so they have done, um, you saw a picture in Steve Kennedy's talk with this baseball pitcher with a bunch of cotton balls sort of stapled to his skin, and they can see with uh, video analysis where things move over time with the same sort of techniques. They've shown that the scaphoid and lunate are almost immobile, one with respect to the next, in the dart thrower's motion, shown here. And so these various axes from one of the reports show the wide variety of motion uh, experienced by the two bones with respect uh, to one another in these other types of motion. But in the dart thrower's motion, the scaphoid and lunate really almost act like one bone. So I find that interesting because it may be that the problem that I find with my perilunates is that they're all stiff because I leave the pins in for three months and then we rehab them only very cautiously so as not to disrupt the SL ligament. It may be that we could get this dart thrower's motion going earlier and get a more functional range of motion earlier and end up with less stiffness. So I throw this out as an idea since with these problems we need all the ideas we can get. But I find this fascinating and I'm going to watch their work with, as they say, considerable interest in the future. So we spoke about greater and lesser arc patterns. And uh, you already know that the SL ligament is required to keep these bones from migrating apart and keep the capitate from uh, propagating uh, proximally. This business shows you the so-called ring sign. And uh, everybody's different, but they always talk about a seven millimeter distance from proximal aspect of the distal pole to proximal pole uh, as being concerning for SL disruption. And so here's another example of that. You have this sort of uh, ring as you tilt the kidney bean, my new term for the scaphoid, uh, and on. So you're sort of shooting down a tube, as Joe Slate has talked about when doing um, arthroscopic uh, repair. And it goes on, if things uh, are allowed to, to this sort of arth arthritic degenerative change. Um, we've spoken again about DZ and VZ. And this is one of the problems if you have things malrotated you suddenly lose the chance to articulate with all of this cartilage and you're grinding down just a few uh, uh, square millimeters. But the, of course, the same amount of load is transmitted, so the cartilage can't endure that for long and you end up with pain. And uh, you could do it with spoons if you were made of spoons. So the, <laughs> the incongruous comment going over well with one of the audience. All right, so the scaphoid can pop out the back. This is almost certainly a dislocation, not just a widened SL distance. I think the lateral will show that. So here's your scaphoid out the back. Here's the lunate tilted dorsally. And uh, for the 12th time, we show you that. This now is a perilunate dislocation. So the lunate remains in its fossa. The entirety of the carpus is a dorsal. And in order to do this, you obviously have to pop both the SL interosseous ligament and the lunotroquetral interosseous ligament, a significant injury. This is the sort of thing that occasionally tumbles into the clinic with the films having been reported as normal three months ago, but the lunate is not where it belongs, and uh, nothing is going to do well for this type of patient. Cartoon uh, showing what the x-ray shows in its fuzzy fashion. You can have variants, so this is transscaphoid perilunate, and these actually paradoxically seem in my hands to do better because the scaphoid heals, but the ligament between the proximal pole and the lunate remain intact. And we actually have a better treatment for scaphoid fractures than we have for disruption of the scaphoid-lunate interosseous ligament. Scaphocapitate syndrome. You can fracture both through the scaphoid and the head of the capitate, which then flips 180 degrees. They describe this as being likely due to a fall on the outstretched hand or fouche with hyperextension and snapping of both those bones simultaneously. Here's a picture of that. So Galula's lines are more like Galula's W here. This thing's popped up. This is the head of the capitate. It wants to be pointing this direction. It's going up, scaphoid fracture. Here's this little ulnar stylite fleck. And again, if uh, the, the admitting clinician sees nothing else but a stylite fracture on each of these two bones, it's important to think that they may have had a far more severe uh, and serious injury needing attention. And so treatment is to open these up, reduce, and stabilize. Uh, expensive, tiny, cute screws get a lot of play, but k words can work as well still. Honesty compels me to tell you, Dr. Berger, that I've been using this um, set of slides for years without attributing them to you, but I couldn't do that today. So uh, <laughs> Dr. Berger <laughs> wrote this in 2007. And if you were here two years ago, you saw me uh, present it. And today, we give credit to the author, uh, the ligament sparing capsulotomy. Um, this uses the anatomy that you've already seen. So we try and preserve uh, 
the dorsal radiocarpal and intercarpal ligaments, there are a lot of advantages to doing that. One of them is that one of the most severe complications of tremendous disruption of the wrist is ulnocarpal dissociation, or I want to say radial trend, uh, slipping off down the radial inclination in an ulnarward direction. And there's really no great treatment for that that isn't a fusion. So if you, res if you preserve the dorsal radiocarpal ligament, you may minimize that. And yet you must also preserve uh, the volar radius capo capitate ligament. Um, as therapists, you may or may not be that interested in this, but it matters a great deal whether your surgeon has done so. So opening up, and these are bony landmarks that are palpable at the time of surgery, the triquetrum and the distal pole is scaphoid. And so linking dot to dot to dot and then incising in line with those fibers. And in some wrists, this is very clear and satisfying. And in other wrists, for me at least, it's sort of a guess. But thanks to Dr. Berger, we can guess with some confidence due to the bones which are uniformly present and palpable. And you can extend this. Sometimes you need a better view radially and you can back cut along here as long as you suture this back in place. And there you go. You can see what you need to see and get done what must be done. If you can't do that, you can just pour gasoline on the wrist and set it on fire. Uh, <laughs> this is a slide from Dr. Meals' Demystify the Wrist. And uh, so I don't actually use a flamethrower in surgery, but um, the point I was trying to make, other than that this is abuse of the Bovi cautery device to an extent previously unseen, is that this thing, if you're, if you're new at this game, you think, well, there the hell, the lunate's right there. I'm golden. But that's not the lunate, that's the capitate. And if you go back and forth, you see, unless I'm causing seizure disorders to kick in, you see this is the proximal row, finally reduced. Capitate is nestled down where it is. And miraculously, the SL ligament was not destroyed with the cautery. Um, this is what it looks like radiographically. Lunate's where it wants to be. The whole hand, everything else is out the back. Scaphoid's here, capitate's here, and the force must be applied in this direction to restore uh, collinearity, and then pin everything like crazy, as you saw in Dr. Friedrich's films. This is a little tough to see, but the lunate's where it belongs here, uh, except the scaphoid's over here, and the capitate's articulating with the radius, which is not intentionally um, desired by any, any surgeon. So we restore this anatomy by moving things around, open approach again, as always, and he had a little piece of proximal scaphoid, so it meant his ligament was actually intact, so the pins here are stabilizing the scaphoid fracture and some more uh, in the radial styloid. Uh, the side view <laughs> looks like he's been attacked by those uh, dart-throwing guys in Borneo, but um, <laughs> these will come out down the line. Uh, another transscaphoid, you can barely appreciate it, but this is, again, these things sort of herald a greater injury. If all you ever saw was that and just a styloid fracture off here, be thinking other things are happening. And uh, again, by the way, so the point is the lunate can often stay in place, but everything is extruded out the back because of the tremendous disruption of the soft tissue uh, attachments. And again, a bunch of uh, pins, little tiny screws for the scaphoid fleck. Um, this must have been stable or we would have addressed the, the uh, ulnar side of the soft tissues. Another one of these things. So this is an intact scaphoid interosseous ligament, but this is the proximal hole of the scaphoid articulating now with the capitate head. And this is the distal pole of the scaphoid, so that can't be right. So we'll get him out of this. He's splinted in the position of non-reduction before transfer to Harborview three weeks later. And then we'll get this thing reduced and fixed. Uh, here, the styloid doesn't matter so much. It'll never unite, but the soft tissues stabilize the ulna to the carpus and to the radius, so it does matter if that's unstable, which it was in his case, to do that. And as I said, I leave these things in for three months, which... Uh, is necessary to try and get things to congeal, but certainly leads to tremendous loss of motion. Um, another blast. Um, this is sort of Galula's wad. There's not even a line to look at. And he's also got some dorsal dis distal radius um, comminution. So something I learned from Doug Hannell and other um, injuries is that you can span this and offload things with a bridge plate. And some of you may have seen these tumbling into your clinic. And so you get everything pieced together and then protect it with this uh, temporary and removable plate. And uh, so this can prevent loss of reduction. Sometimes with the extent of the injury, it's difficult to feel confident in just K-wire fixation. Uh, speaking of disclosures, I, don't, I have nothing to disclose, but I wish 
I had a piece of the K-wire business in the world. So I admit these guys usually because it's tremendously disruptive to sustain an injury like this, and it can be to receive surgery for it. I didn't mention carpal tunnel syndrome, but it's not uncommon. But my general approach has been if that arose at the time of the injury, I'm not surprised. The nerves have been pounded on by this bone that it's not used to seeing up so close. Once you get that thing uh, out of the way, I think you've decompressed it from the underside of the nerve, which is the non-standard approach to releasing the carpal tunnel. Um, if they progress with symptoms, then I take them back and release it. They don't seem ordinarily to need it. Need it. So I do keep these guys immobilized for three months, and uh, it's a long time before they're out and uh, pitching or what have you. Um, it's a not uncommon injury. The path mechanics do help predict the pattern, uh, especially when you're thinking about the LT disruption. It's important to wander over there and look at that ligament as well. Although, as Dr. Berger said, the stoutest portion is volars. It's difficult to repair that, but it seems that piecing the rest of the carpus together allows for that to heal. S <laughs> results good. Um, finger quotes. My seven-year-old now does finger quotes, which is alarming, but I would put finger quotes around good with results in long-term series. Um, I'm just going to blast through. I'm not going to talk about slack or snack because you've heard all that I think you can tolerate about that. But I'll move ahead and just say again that um, things do fail in ways that you can predict based on the anatomy. We can't fix the SLIL ligament yet, or I can't. Overshooting gives up on motion and uh, chooses instead stability and strength, which is maybe not a bad trade off. Uh, it would be best to re reconstruct things as nearly normally as one could. Uh, and I do think, though, down the line, that this business of the dart thrower's motion might be a way for us to think about more rapid return to earlier motion and functional motion, because nobody really just flexes or radially deviates, but a combination of those and then the opposite of that motion. So, and maybe you guys can tell me at the break if you've seen somebody do well with uh, more early return to range of motion than what I've described to you. And uh, luckily for you, I think that's it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Humble, modest, and self-deprecating uh, surgeons you'll ever meet. I'm actually going to ask uh, Carol Recor to next introduce Dr. Uh, Sue Michaelvitz. So it's, it's quite an honor for me to be able to stand in front of you and introduce um, Dr. Michaelovitz to you. As, you. as Dr. Wong talked about this morning, she is the um, president-elect of the American Society of Hand Therapists. She's the co-editor of Modalities for Therape Therapeutic Intervention, the assistant editor of Journal of Hand Therapy, she sits on the editorial board for uh, Hand Journal, which is the Journal of the American Association for Hand Surgery. She's an adjunct associate professor at Columbia University a professor at the Rocky Mountain University of Health Science, Sciences, um, is in has her practice in Ithaca, New York, and in her spare time, apparently, also volunteers for the Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation. So it's uh, really a pleasure and an honor to introduce to you Dr. Sue Michaelovitz. I just have to flip around a little technology here. This is like Mac City up here. <laughs> Presently, if, I think I'll sell a couple of these so I can afford to get back to Ithaca. There are three Macs up here right now. Would anybody like a MacBook Pro? I'll sell it for $9.90. And a Microsoft Town. This is fantastic. Then I'll pick it up from my oh, can I pick it up from my computer? Is there an audio hookup for the computer? Sir, how do you hook up for the computers anyway now? Okay. There should be there was a Okay, I'm just gonna see if there's an audio hookup from the computer at all. Um, it won't. Okay. Will it pay f play from U uh, YouTube on my, on my thing? Yeah, iTunes uh, on my thing. Hopefully, you'll be able to fix it. Okay. Yeah, you're not Is there a plug we can plug into? Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 
Is there an audio plug that I can plug in, phone. plug my iPhone in for a minute? Or into my computer? Is that, is that an audio? Okay, I just need it for this afternoon, not today, right now, so that's okay, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll play what I was going to play after lunch. Apparently, I'm, I'm a one sort of in anchor right now where I get to flap my gums a little bit before the cadaver presentation before lunch. And then I'm back again after lunch. And when I return after lunch, I'm going to discuss provocative maneuvers before Guatemala. And the reason for that is people usually stay awake for about 325 nanoseconds after lunch. So I can talk about provocative maneuvers and then wake you up with my Guatemala talk after that. So if that's okay with you, I'm switching the order. I'm very happy to be here in Seattle. Um, one of the two times that Dick Berger was in Seattle before he came this time, I don't know how many of you were at his musical debut with, with Alan Bishop. Did anybody hear him at his musical debut? at the ASSH, ASHT combined meeting. They opened the meeting with um, uh, their musical talent. So he's also a musician. Um, now, I have something to say to Chris Allen. I think, Dr. Chris Allen, you were pretty funny. <laughs> but you know what? You made some slam about Case Western Reserve University, right? Well, I went to undergrad there. <laughs> Woo. <laughs> Okay, so we'll have a talk about that later. <laughs> anyway, I'm here to share with you a few thoughts on how we as therapists may think about managing patients who have mobility and stability problems. I come from uh, fairly far away from here, from Ithaca, New York. I spent most of my formative years in Philadelphia for 34 years in university life. I bailed university life and moved up to Ithaca. Um, to be with my guy who uh, presently, about 10 minutes ago, finished giving a lecture at Cornell that you probably wouldn't have liked to have heard. It's, it was a statistics lecture to a math conference there. Uh, in my small private practice in Ithaca, um, we try to keep uh, my office fairly well decorated. We had a color of hands program where kids got to come and color hands on the outside of my office to help decorate it. We do have snow and we also have water. We have, we're on the, um, on the uh, base of one of the largest, of the, of the largest Finger Lake, and we also are filled with gorges and waterfalls that go perpendicular into the Finger Lake. It's a lovely place to be. I see a variety of, of kinds of patients in my practice, ranging from patients who have shoulder pathologies. I see a number of professional musicians who are on faculty at the universities and also perform in the area. I see patients who have had um, procedures like contraction release with digit widgets put in, patients who have had uh, Zyaflex injections for Dupuytren's contracture, patients who have distal radio ulnar joint instability, and a number of athletes who are at both of our university and college, uh, respectively, at uh, Cornell University. We do have a hockey team, and apparently they're pretty good, and also Ithaca College, which has a big performing arts school. So I, I have a variety of patients, a little different than maybe some of the demographics that, um, that you have here in a, a much larger metropolitan area. When I first started practicing in Ithaca, one of my first patients uh, apologized to me for only having a bachelor's degree. She's an outlier for not having a doctoral degree in our area. So my patients ask a whole lot of questions. It can be exhausting sometimes. I also do have a financial disclosure to make that I added this morning because um, they said that somebody out there is hocking my book. And uh, if we happen to sell any today, the royalties that I would gain from it would not go directly to me. I will donate those to Guatemala Healing Hands Foundation. So I sort of have a financial disclosure, but not really. Um, also, in the beginning of your booklet, there are two membership applications or information for two professional societies and I thought that I would have to mention a little bit about the societies I've been involved with. The primary group that I've been working with over the last um, uh, 39 years is American Physical Therapy Association, because my roots come as a PT. 
but I also have been very involved in hand societies, um, particularly the American Association for Hand Surgery. That's where I met Dr. Nick Vetter and uh, Dick Berger. In fact, uh, Nick and I worked on the bylaws together to make sure that therapists can be on the board of directors of that society. Um, I also um, have been involved with ASHT since about 1992 when I took my CHT exam and happened to pass it. I was, that was lucky for me. Um, I don't know if it was lucky for them, but it was lucky for me. And I, I am an affiliate member of the ASSH. I think the primary advantage for the affiliate classification, though, is for mid-level practitioners who have the opportunity to go to a meeting where they work with their um, hand surgeons in practice. So it's, I think for NPs or for PAs, it will be a very good society for them to be involved in. Also for therapists like uh, Chris Novak, who have devoted their life to um, testing outcomes that surgeons have been uh, uh, carrying out uh, surgeries, that I think for that type of therapist, it's a really valuable organization to liaison with the surgeons. I'm also an international member of the Canadian Society of Hand Therapists, and Trevor Frazier and a couple of other people from that society are here today. An honorary member of uh, the Guatemalan uh, Healing Hand, uh, Guatemalan Society of Hand Therapists, and the Venezuelan Society of Hand Therapists. So I guess I must be an association groupie or junkie. I'm not quite sure. Uh, when we go to meetings, we have the opportunity to liaison and meet um, very nice surgeons, and two of them are here with us today, and others are with us today are also very nice. So let's go on to the topic that I'm supposed to discuss. And that's um, how we deal with conditions affecting the wrist. And from a therapist's point of view, we need to classify our patients based on some of the impairments that they have and the functional deficits they have. So when I think about managing patients with upper extremity pathologies, I look at them in the realm of whether they have a problem with stability, irritability, and mobility. And when I teach my students, we look at examination procedures related to that and intervention procedures related to that. Uh, we're going to talk, though, today uh, just about uh, carpal instability. And the mainstays of therapy for carpal instability have been protection, including immobilization, or allowing the person to move through a limited arc of motion. When they move through that limited arc of motion, we have them move very cautiously through that limited arc of motion. We also try to avoid undue stresses to the structures that have been injured. We limit closed chain and uh, plyometric activities. If there is a frank instability, do isometric strengthening and about that joint to try to activate the muscles to try to stabilize and also carry out functional activities with that patient, oftentimes when they're in an immobilization orthoses or splint. Rosemary Proser and her associates in Australia have contributed a lot to what we know about managing carpal instability. And she did a survey that was published in the Journal of Hand Therapy in 2007 that reviewed the practice patterns of uh, therapists in Australia who treated carpal instability problems. And these are the types of interventions that she found to be the most prevalent. We have to be cautious with these patients with some of the techniques that we really like to do. We love to mobilize joints. We love to glide joints, slide them, glide them, roll them. But that's not always appropriate in patients who have instability problems. Um, we also very frequently try to maximize range of motion. We spend a lot of time getting more motion in many of our patients. In this patient population, that might not be the most appropriate thing to do. We also love to teach strengthening exercises, particularly grip strengthening exercises. And we know that it's an increase in load of the capitate wedging between the scaphoid and the lunate during gripping activities. We also know that if, we're in the pronate, if the person's forearm is in the pronated position and they grip, there's an increased impaction on the ulnar side of the wrist. So grip activities for many of these patients may not be the first line of defense to managing their problem. What do we do about one of our favorite kinds of exercises for patients? Progressive resisted exercises. DeLorme and Watkins made that very popular back in the late 1940s, and we all have spent lots of time having our patients do three reps of 10 of X number of weights for X number of times during the week. Well, if you think about the three-dimensional motions at the wrist and how we teach PREs, they don't, there's a mismatch there. 
PREs are typically taught in one plane of motion, and we know that our wrist moves in three planes of motion, at least. So should we alter the direction of our rehab? Um, I also decided after Dr. Chris Allen's presentation to add the Baxter and Shana Puna Mike Lovett sign, which is pictured on the right. So let's talk about changing paradigm with the patients who we see. There's been a lot of good work recently about patterns of motion relating to the dart thrower's motion. There's also been significant work that has been published by um, uh, two uh, surgeons from, um, uh, from Europe that I'll discuss their work in a little bit on sensory motor retraining using concepts of proprioception, kinesthesia, and neuromuscular reeducation. We have many examples of sensory motor retraining in patients who have been studied with knee problems like anterior cruciate ligament pathologies, shoulder instability, and ankle instability following ligamentous injuries of the ankle. We also um, th have to think about using perturbations and selective muscle retraining in patients who may have instabilities across the wrist for years, for decades. Therapists have been using quadriceps and hamstring co-activation techniques to stabilize the knee. We haven't always thought about those concepts in treating patients who have wrist, wrist problems. We know a lot more about the kinematics of the wrist, and both of these sources, I believe, were referenced. Um, one on the International um, um, uh, Federation of Societies of Hand Surgery um, classification for a discussion of dart thrower's motion and the article that was discussed uh, where uh, Crisco was the first author that was published in the Journal of Hand Surgery in 2011. Both of those are listed in your handout. The dart thrower's motion is uh, one that's fairly easy to incorporate in our rehabilitation programs, and I'll be giving some examples of that. How many of you are presently incorporating some type of dart thrower's motion in the management of your patients with carpal instability? doing that? There are therapists in Australia and therapists in this country and some in Europe presently studying that. I know Aviva Wolf is very involved in studying this in her patient population in hospital, at Hospital for Special Surgery at Cornell. Uh, the carpal instability and therapy paradigm are probably or definitely different in patients who have partial tears or wrist sprains in patients who may have a dynamic instability. Different in, at, in those in patients who have a, a true and frank disassociation between the scaphoid and lunate or the lunate and triquetrum, and certainly different than those patients who have gone on to have a degenerative changes in their wrist like a slacker snack wrist. So I'm going to be discussing a bit about some of the newer concepts in the patients that we may see with partial tears who have wrist sprains and may have some dynamic instability. And think about new paradigm. The concepts that I'm presenting have been written and, and, um, and theorized primarily by Elizabeth Haggart, who is a wonderfully lovely hand surgeon and uh, PhD physiologist from Stockholm, Sweden. Um, we had the opportunity to teach uh, at a meeting in Canada together last year, and, Tre and uh, Trevor Frazier worked us so hard we had to go for a seaplane ride after that to decompress. Anyway, a lot of her work that she's done for her doctoral work and subsequent to that has really made us rethink what we do in rehabilitation of these patients. Uh, she has proposed six stages of rehabilitation. And how many of you had the opportunity to read her article related to this in the Journal of Hand Therapy in January of 2010? For those of you who have not, I'd probably leave right now and do that and not listen to the rest of my talk. It's a very well-conceived and, and thought-out article and piece of work. So she's divided rehab into six basic stages. Number one is basic rehab. Two is proprioceptive awareness. Three is joint position sense. Four is kinesthesia. Five, conscious proprioception. And six, unconscious proprioception. 
some of the thoughts for um, uh, what she has proposed are based on some of the work that she's done as part of her doctoral dissertation in physiology, looking at muscle responses to um, uh, stretching the scapholunate interosseous ligament. And what she did in this particular model that, I've, that is pictured here, and you don't have a copy of this in your handout, but she has given me permission to use it in my presentation today, is a look at what happens over time in milliseconds, that's a very brief duration, to the EMG response or amplitude of muscle activation when the wrist is in extension and the scapholunate interosseous ligament is electrically stimulated to stimulate afferent fibers. The first initial response is, to, is for the flexor muscles to contract to prevent the wrist from going back any further. The, the response after that, and one that lasts a bit longer, is the activation of the extensor carpi radialis brevis, pictured in blue, in navy blue. I'm sorry if anybody's colorblind out there because you won't be able to differentiate these colors. The extensor carpi ulnaris in red, and the flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris in green and in light blue, respectively. Basically, what, what happens is in order to stabilize the wrist, even through a small amount of motion, there's a co-contraction of muscles across the wrist. And that's nothing new to us as therapists from what we've learned about what we've done in shoulder rehab and knee rehab. And all the principles we had to suffer through of learning proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, rude facilitation techniques, and other things like that. She also has divided proprioception into conscious and unconscious proprioception and, and suggested different training programs related to that. For conscious rehabilitation or proprioception, the components of the program that are included included something about kinesthesia, joint position sense, and tensile force sense. Unconscious proprioception, which is at a higher level, includes postural activities, joint stability activities, and feed-forward control. So let's go over some more specific examples of this. Does anybody know what time I started, by the way? I'm trying to keep time up here. 12.05, and I have uh, 12 more minutes, something like that. OK. Um, so stage one for basic re rehabilitation, nothing new to us. We control pain, inflammation, provide some type of rest, and orthotic options including perhaps a circumferential splint. There are also other orthotic options that allow patients to go through a limited range of motion. This is um, a dart thrower's motion splint. It's only one example of kinds of orthoses that are used to limit an arc of motion for radial sided or scaphalunate instability problems. In patients who may have mid-carpal stability problems, which is different than SL, and those problems are managed differently. If they have a sag on the ulnar side of the wrist, and we can reduce that sag by putting a force against the uh, pisiform and against the proximal carpal row, those patients may benefit from an orthosis that it provides a boost on the ulnar side of the wrist and across the proximal carpal row. So we really have to look at the kinds of instability problems the patient has to use an orthotic device to help control to allow the tissues to rest and heal a bit. Um, for sta uh, her stage one basic rehab, we also have our patients reduce weight-bearing activities, and this is an example of how they can do that from the New York Times uh, cover page online this morning. Stage two is proprioceptive awareness, and we really are very excited now about new techniques in rehab, and one that we are very excited about is mirror, mirror on the wall or on the table. In order to facilitate proprioceptive uh, awareness, mirror therapy has been utilized. We know it was originally utilized in stroke rehabilitation, and then that was carried over to managing patients with pain problems, like the four-letter word complex regional pain syndrome, and also in, in working with patients with focal dystonia. Uh, 
It also is a technique that we can use to try to make our patients more aware of their motion when they have wrist instability problems. They can do this in a position where they're unloaded and a position where their wrist is slightly loaded, but with a very, very light gripping activity, not a heavy gripping activity. Stage three involves joint position sense, and we position the joint and ask the patient to reproduce that position after we have done that. It's um, one uh, technique uh, that I have used years past when I worked with a lot of people that had total hips and total knee replacements in the 1970s when I was about three years old, uh, was a technique where I'd work with patients who have had hip and knee replacements and position the operated limb in a certain position at, at, at the unoperated limb in a certain position and have them position the operated limb in that position. When the joint capsule and capsular ligaments that are interrupted, proprioceptive and kinesthetic sense change. So I would use this as a retraining technique to teach people how to be aware of the position their hip was in. Back in the old days, we had to be very conscious of how we positioned hips because if they crossed over or did certain things, the hip joint would dislocate. Kinesthesia is a stage four, and that's increasing awareness of motion. She suggests that you have the person have no auditory and visual feedback by putting a headset on and blinders. I think that would probably freak out a lot of my patients to do that. Uh, but you can have them close their eyes, move their joint passively through a motion, and have them tell you when the joint is moving. So one is to position the joint in a certain way, and the other is to detect motion. You need to be in a relatively quiet clinic space to do that. If you work in a sports medicine center and 25 people are lined up that have had ACL reconstructions, it's not going to work. Stage five is conscious neuromuscular rehabilitation of coactivation of muscles, activities to strengthen muscle, including some light grip and pinch activities, and graded resisted motion through wrist and forearm motion. You can use the dart thrower's position with different wands. You can use a very, very light ball and have the person do coactivation as they move through a range of motion. There are a lot of things that we can do to be creative to do this. Use exercise bands in the dart thrower's motion instead of in the straight plane motion. We can use the old PNF patterns. As much as we hated learning them, they can come back and be useful in, in, uh, in stabilization procedures for the wrist. Starting in one of the diagonals with the shoulder internally rotated going up in external rotation. The final stage is unconscious neuromuscular re-education where we can use plyometric activities and activities for stabilization like is used with the trademark name body blade are boing, and have your patients do this activity. How many people use this for upper extremity wrist and elbow rehab in your clinics? Good, a lot of people. I have my patients get these for home use also. They're not that expensive for them, and uh, particularly my patients who are gym rats. It keeps them out of the gym for a little while. The finals, the, uh, another activity that's suggested is using um, a, a, a power ball that rotates around and vibrates and allows the wrist to be challenged in different positions. Uh, you can get these in a, at most sporting goods stores uh, in your area. Then you may go to more functional activities for unconscious neuromuscular activation. So what else could, what could we be doing than our, our traditional programs? How can, also, how can we assess function by, approve, by improving stability? or excuse me, how can we address function by improving stability? We can use motor control and muscle activation concepts perhaps to compensate for deficient ligamentous stability, perhaps. There's been a lot of work done looking at patients who have ACL deficient knees. The leaders in this field have been Lynn Slater Mackler from the University of Delaware. She presently has a $10 million grant from NIH to look at this over a number of years, and Kelly Fitzgerald at the University of Pittsburgh. They have looked at copers versus non-copers. These are patients who have ACL um, injury, and there's a group of them who are able to cope and control their quadriceps, 
and their hamstrings and do functional activities and may not need to go to surgery. And then there are non-copers who cannot cope with ligamentous deficiency. There's evidence that these patients who are non-copers do better or will do better if they have a rehabilitation program of neuromuscular training before they go on to surgery. And in fact, some of them who were previously thought to be non-copers don't need to go on to surgery. Uh, Lynn is studying this with a colleague from Norway to um, do a prospective trial to look at patients and see how they do with a year of, of neuromuscular training and do they need to go to surgery. Another problem is, is when you have a reconstruction of a ligament, we know the joint is more stable, but what happens to the neuromuscular activation? Just because the ligament's fixed doesn't mean the person can move better. It means they might not hurt as much, but their motor control may be a bit off. Uh, I would like to um, just briefly discuss post-op rehab, since we don't have much of a clue of what we're doing in post-op rehab. We try to keep the joint stable and not ruin the surgery that the surgeon has done. A couple of other people have talked about post-op paradigm today, so I'm not going to do that, if that's okay with you. What I'd like to, ta to end with and go over for the next uh, few minutes or so, if I can have a few minutes, is that okay, guys? Is what we can do to um, document recovery and activity milestones in our patients who have carpal instability. We don't know a lot about how they do over time. There is a study that it will be coming out in the Journal of Hand Therapy in July that Rosemary Proser has done. It's a prognostic study looking at how patients do one year following wrist arthroscopy for wrist sprains and other wrist problems. But other than that, there's not, not a whole lot that we know. So we need to start looking at, para, at therapy paradigm and developing them that relate to what we know about recovery milestones in these patients and try to be a bit creative to improve their neuromuscular control and return to function. We, in order to do this, we have to document our patient's recovery very well. In order to do that, we need to be able to use reliable, valid, and responsive outcomes measures to assess our patients, including patient-reported outcomes measures and clinician-based outcomes measures. The patient-reported outcomes measures, as we know, are questionnaires and surveys. Ten years ago, hardly anybody was using them. These have been out for at least 15 years and very well studied. Now, more therapists are using them because they're linked to reimbursement. That is the only way the change has been made to incorporate these. Joy McDermott and I have been tracking use of these outcomes measures over a number of years, and I can probably stand here pretty confidently and say the only reason people are using them in therapy in most instances is they're not going to get approval for therapy if they don't. It's a bad reason to use them, but anyway. So these, are, um, uh, these incorporate um, aspects of evidence-based practice and patient-centered care to give the patient's perspective on how they're doing. I would recommend that you select two tools for your patients. One is a regional or disease-specific tool. For patients with carpal instability, I'd recommend using the patient-rated wrist and hand evaluation because 50% of it is derived from pain. And a lot of our patients who have wrist instability have a primary comp complaint of pain. Another that I'd recommend is one that has recently been studied in upper extremity conditions. It's a patient-specific functional scale that was originally developed by Paul Stratford from McMaster University. And it was originally validated for knee problems, neck problems, and shoulder problems. Most recently, the patient-specific functional scale was validated for upper extremities also. The patient's act asked to pick three to five activities that they have the most difficulty doing and rate their ability to do those specific activities. Then you bring those specific activities back to the patient again at reevaluation. We know that uh, if the patients have changed a certain number of points, we can, uh, we can say that's a clinically important difference and that the patient has improved in that particular activity. The validation study on this for upper extremities was published in the Journal of Orthopedic and Sports PT in February of 2012. Our clinician-based measures inc include those of performance, range of motion, 
grip strength testing, that's nothing new to us, and more. Perhaps in patients who have low demands of the wrist, we can use a functional test like a dexterity test to simulate motions that they have to do when they're using the wrist. There also may be certain functional performance tests to use. One functional dexterity test that has been studied the most recently is a functional dexterity test that was developed by Dorit Aaron and originally published in 2003. The um, normative data for that has recently been presented at ASSH, AAHS, and ASHT by Dorit Aaron, her colleague, um, a Gloria, whose last name I can't remember, who's a, who is a surgeon at Shriners in Texas, and my husband, Paul Velleman, who's a statistician on the study. And we know that there's now normative data for this, and we also know good ways to score that. And as soon as our manuscript is sent in, it was just finished, it should be available hopefully in the next six months or so. As far as functional performance, I want us as therapists to think about how we assess functional performance in this patient population. So where do we go from here? We need to develop therapy paradigm based on principles of, bio, of uh, biomechanics and neuromuscular re-education. And until that time, I have one take home message for us. Go back and tell your potential patients not to fall down for 10 years until we figure out how we, how, what we're doing with carpal instability to maximize the functional outcome. Thank you. Thanks. Do we have any questions for Dr. Michaelvis as we switch over to the promote? The question is, how soon would I move somebody through a range of motion or a partial range of motion using a dart thrower's motion with an SL repair um, within a few weeks? Some people move them earlier. Uh, the surgeon who I work with the most in our town is a young surgeon who is HSS trained, and they've been moving their people a little bit earlier. As one, of, one of Scott Wolf's protégés, yes, is in our town now. She's a wonderful surgeon. Pardon? We don't know yet. Okay. And I haven't had enough experience in that, honestly. It's something that I think you'll hear more about in a year or two or three. How soon are you moving your people? You just wrote the talk. <laughs> okay. Yeah, and, and uh, Terry Scorvin in Philly's had some decent experience with that also, and it moves them in a limited motion splint fairly early on. Thank you. We have the uh, audio fixed over at the Cadaver Lab. Uh, Got to be really hungry. So we're going to switch over to the Cadaver Lab and do about 10 minutes on carpal anatomy, hit on the key points, and uh, all the wonderful anatomy that our speakers went over earlier. I'm actually going to have Dr. Friedrich and Dr. Berger moderate this session. All right, can you hear us now? Turn this mic on. Hi, can you guys hear us? Yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear us? We can yeah. hear you. Oh, wow, good. <laughs> okay, wow. give us, um, obviously we're oriented and we can see, you know, stem to stern there. So I'm assuming you'll zoom in and then give us a little overview. Okay, so we're going to start with a basic dorsal approach to the wrist. So we just made a longitudinal incision over the dorsum of the wrist. And we've already opened this up. And the first thing that we see over here are the extensor tendons going to the digits. Um, we've also kind of gone further and done a dissection. So here's the extensor retinaculum, which houses all of the extensor tendons going to the fingers as well as to the wrist. And so we had opened that up previously, and this is kind of standard how we do it surgically as well. And so here we peel off the retinaculum and we see the, tendon, we see the uh, extensor tendons going to the digits here. And then here is the uh, sorry, extensor pollicis longus um, going around Lister's tubercle and that we frequently take out surgically as well as we're doing this approach. So we're gonna retract all of these tendons to 
expose the carpal bones. Um, what kind of capsulotomy did you do? And so we did a um, ligament sparing capsulotomy. So these are the ligaments that Dr. Berger had previously talked about. And I'm not sure if it shows up on camera that well, but um, here is the uh, dorsal intercarpal uh, ligament coming from the scaphoid and the trapezoid and then to the triquetrum over here. And these run essentially longitudinally and those are split. And, f and on, and over here is the uh, radiocarpal ligament um, running from the radius um, also to attach to the triquetrum. And here you can actually see some very nice fibers over here. And that's lifted up as a triangle to expose the proximal to expose the carpal bones. So let's see. Here we have the scaphoid, the lunate, and the triquetrum. Here is the capitate, the hamate, and here it's little and hiding under there will be um, trapezium and trapezoid. And if we kind of flex the wrist, we can see where the scaphoid comes out. And so in this person, actually, um, this person had a scapholunate tear. Um, so this is not something that we did during the exposure, but there is an actual <laughs> scapholunate tear. Um, and we, I, tried, I wanted to perform a Watson shift test on here to see how it works, but it actually, this, I think this cadaver is just too unstable to actually show much of anything. So we're unable to do that. Without, um, the, without the Watson's test, though, can you move the, uh, move the specimen through radial or deviation just to show, even with that unstable scaphoid, okay. what happens uh, in ulnar deviation? Can you all see how that scaphoid flattens out so and extends? So here we are moving radial, I'm sorry, ulnar, this is ulnar deviation. Yeah. And here is so radial when, deviation as the scaphoid flex, flexes. Flex. So there you see more of the scaphoid. So now the scaphoid's, you can't extending. see all of the scaphoid, but it's now extending. And now it's extending and, you can see and it's kind of hiding. the proximal pole beneath the distal carpal row. So again, here's yeah. radial deviation. And let's see, let's point to the scaphoid. Here's the scaphoid, and then with ulnar deviation. And you can see the same behavior with the lunate and the triquetrum as well. It's just that the scaphalonic dissociation, it dis it's dissociated, but it's the same general, general motion. Mm -hmm. And also, one thing before, before you go on too, um, on the floor of the fourth extensor compartment, uh, mm -hmm. paralleling your EPO where it is right now. Uh, it's a beautiful view right there. That's right the posterior here. interosseous nerve. This is, let's move this retractor out of the way. This, so this is the posterior interosseous nerve. And um, this is where we do a P, uh, PIN neurectomy as well. We usually take out a small segment of the nerve right here. And this is just the nerve at this point is going only to the capsule. So purely so, a sensory nerve at So this I'll interrupt point. with a question of that. It, with, for Dr. Berger, do you feel like I've always felt like when you do this ligament sparing capsulotomy, to some degree you're getting a PIN norectomy yeah. as you cut across the dorsal radiocarpal ligament. Yeah, and I, I, it's, it's one of those unfortunate dilemmas that if you think about it too much, it'll paralyze you. Uh, <laughs> you know, because, you know, no matter, you know, even if you make your incision distally, are we catching some right. of the terminal fibers of the, of the PIN? Mm -hmm. I don't do intentional anterior and posterior interosseous mm -hmm. norectomies on, on a patient unless they have. Uh, advanced degenerative disease. Mm -hmm. uh, so if they have another, if they just have a painful wrist, right. you know, ganglion or, or or some other problem, I'll I'll try to I'll try to at least leave the anterior interosseous nerve intact. But realizing that no matter how you design your capsulotomy dorsally, you're probably going to affect the posterior interosseous nerve. We still need adequate exposure to do the things that we're doing. So I think it's a matter of, of there's a theoretical implication at this point still with the posterior interosseous nerve in terms of its uh, 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 role in reflex arcs of balancing uh, uh, opposing muscle groups versus a very real uh, uh, concept of destabilizing the wrist if we, if we uh, uh, inadvertently take out too many of those dorsal mm -hmm. stabilizing ligaments. So it's a little bit of a, it, it's, a uh, it's a game of choosing which risk to take from a surgeon's mm -hmm. standpoint. But I don't have any doubt that we're partially denervating the wrist whenever we do any kind of a capsulotomy. And actually that's right at the three, four portal. So you might even be bagging some of those fibers when you that's do a scope. Yeah. yeah. What else do you have to show us, Lucy? So that's about it for the dorsal wrist. We do have another one where um, 
we did a uh, proximal row carpectomy. We'll show that in a minute. It's on a different cadaver. So we're going to go to the volar side of the wrist at this point. And here we kind of did an extended incision, not something we typically do surgically. This is really the best way to see what we needed to see. This is and not your usual carpal tunnel release. No, no, not typically. Um, and so here, exposure. actually, let's put the skin back. Um, usually we do an incision from here to here for the carpal tunnel. And actually, as we open that up, right underneath is the transverse carpal ligament. And here it's been sectioned. And there's quite a bit of tension on it. I can't, actually can't put it back together. But these are the ends this of the, the transverse carpal ligament. You can see it truly is a very distinct, quite thickened structure. Um, and so as we open that up, we have um, the flexor tendons that go through the carpal tunnel in addition to the median nerve, um, of course. Kind of hard to see which is which because it's a little bit dried out. But I think that this is actually the median nerve over here and the remainder of the flexor yeah. tendons. Um, then we can pull those out of the way and take a look at some of the volar carpal ligaments. Um, so unfortunately on the cadaver, in, you know, in these views, it's kind of difficult to see where the actual fibers run. But surprisingly, we were able to dissect some of them. Um, so, but in order to see it better, I kind of drew them in with marker, and hopefully some of that shows. So here, this line going across, that is the distal radius. And right here, kind of curvilinear, is the radioscaphocapitate ligament. And here is the long radiolunate, so going to the lunate, and here is the short radiolunate. And again, I think it's kind of difficult to see, but and it's very deep. It's below the carpal tunnel, and it, all the tendons need to come out of the way to even get to this portion of the wrist. Um, so, is, and um, is there anything else on the volar wrist that you'd like to see? Well, uh, one thing, and you, mm -hmm. you just made a, you made a beautiful point of this, too, is that between the long and the short radiolunate ligaments is the radioscaphal lunate ligament. Right. And historically, that's been thought to be an important stabilizer right of the scaphal lunate mm -hmm. joint. But if we look at it, it's, it's actually more of a mesocapsule. It's got a lot of blood vessels. It's got a lot of nerve. Big, fluffy thing when you look at it arthroscopically. Terry Whipple called it the interarticular fat pad. It, it's, it's really not a, a ligament. And mm -hmm. it's actually represented here as a hole. There's, a, there's yeah. actually a hole or a space kind between of, the long and the short radiolunate ligaments where the blood vessels mm -hmm. and the terminal fibers of the anterior interosseous nerve penetrate up into the, uh, into the joint space. So when you see the radioscaphalunate ligament in the literature, mm -hmm. kind of think of it more as, as possibly more of a proprioceptive structure than a mechanical stabilizer. Okay. So we just have a, a couple of minutes before we want to let people get out and eat. Uh, any thing from the audience that you would like to see on the, on the wrist here? We do have um, one of the things that someone requested was to see what it looks like when we do a proximal row carpectomy. Because the idea in this is that we take out the proximal carpal row and then the uh, capitate sits in the lunate fossa. And so hopefully here we can, here we did a proximal row carpectomy. And let's see, and here, is the capitate, kind of if we flex the wrist, I don't know if you can see that, is the lunate fossa here. I get this tendons. The lunate fossa is right here, and once we are done with the surgery, you can go ahead and lift this up. The capitate sits right here, and it, and it really does sit quite well within the lunate fossa. It does That's have, it. obviously, a little bit more give than, if, than the lunate, but this is about the motion that you get in that area. So. And if you distract that just a little bit, you'll see the radioscaphal capitate ligament. So and, and that's what still stabilizes the capitate to the radius. Instead of being oriented distally, mm -hmm. as, the as the capitate migrates proximally, the radioscaphal capitate yeah. ligament simply reorients itself to a more, yeah. more transverse orientation. And that's what stabilizes that capitate. There's nothing else. The short, long radial ligaments are gone. This is, this is the radioscaphal capitate right here. I think this is the long radiolunate. Radiolunate, so yeah. Radioscaphal capitate right here. Yep. Long radiolunate and short late radiolunate somewhere in there. Unfortunately, probably went with the proximal carpal row. But you can see the RSC quite well. Right. So um, 
Lucy, we just have a couple more minutes left. With the one with the intact proximal row, mm -hmm. uh, someone from the audience requested, could you show the dart thrower's motion from, probably best from dorsal, right? Can you, can you Let's replicate try. that? Let's see. This will be interesting. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. Let's see if we can open up so we can see under so we can see the ligaments. I should try that. Let's so it's try <coughs> the... Yeah, extension and radial more, deviation and flexion more. and ulnar deviation. So this is dart throwers. And you can really see how that motion in particular will exaggerate the instability between the scaphoid and the lunate. That's interesting. That was apparently pre-existing. <laughs> yes. It wasn't me. Okay. Yeah. We're, all, we're all predisposed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we'll probably wrap it up there and, uh, and go have a little bit of lunch. What time do you want to back? Yeah, that's Plano Reconvenia at 1.30. 1.30, people. We're just out there, so uh, enjoy your lunch.